You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's single, my hate and nothing better. Put on the road, I just win. I know we got a million dollars, the devil that's it, and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the second part of What If Naruto Enters Frozen. Smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Naruto was lying on his bed inside the room that had been his home for the past week. Not that he minded living here, truthfully he really enjoyed being with his new friend Elsa. But yesterday was one of the weirdest days that he had ever experienced. Okay maybe it wasn't the weirdest, he had fought against several self-proclaimed gods. But not only did he learn that Elsa was some kind of noble, but he was living in her castle. Being restrained to his bed meant it was difficult to look out the window, save for when he tried to escape through said window, but he didn't really get a good look due to being grabbed by Elsa's eyes. He was only able to look outside while Elsa took him on a tour of the castle. In truth he should have honestly known he was in a castle due to the amount of servants running around, but in his defenses he was never that observant. But even though it was odd that he was now living in a castle, it was the snowman and deer creature that were still on his mind. Having had the night to think about it, Naruto realized that he shouldn't have been as unsettled by the living snowman as he was, but when Olaf started running at him and yelling, he really didn't have any reason to believe that the snowman wasn't a threat. Although thinking back he should have figured that he was safe when Elsa didn't react the same way, and instead stood next to the snowman. Thankfully that whole fiasco was resolved quickly, even if he had to carry Elsa out of the way of a charging Sven. Apparently the snowman and whatever Sven was, he still wasn't sure, were just both overly excitable. Not that he had any room to talk, according to Sakura. And thinking of Sakura, even with the new additions to the friends he had made in this strange place, Naruto wondered how everyone was doing back home. He knew they were all safe since he had beaten Kaguya, but he couldn't help but wonder about how they were getting along now that the war was over. Maybe he'd see them again someday, and he could introduce them to his new friends here. He bet that they'd all really like Elsa, but that was for the future and in his past while he needed to focus on today. So once he had woken up that day he had started in on some basic exercises to keep himself fit. He had been doing this in secret at night, since he worried that Elsa would disapprove of him being out of bed. But with the tour yesterday he figured that he should be able allowed out of his bed for a bit. And while Elsa seemed to be initially displeased when she showed up, she eventually relented. Naruto believed it was because he had shown her that he was perfectly alright and healthy enough for some light training. Although he might have gone too far when he was showing Elsa that his body was fine when he flexed his shirtless muscles and she went red in the face. He really hoped he hadn't made her angry, but at least she relented and let him continue his workout. So for the first little bit Elsa sat at her desk while Naruto continued to exercise, under her watchful eyes. It wasn't long before Naruto stopped, mainly because he wouldn't be able to do anything else in the bedroom. So with nothing left he begrudgingly sat back in his ice bed, and proceeded to wait like he had done for the past week. He had thought to ask Elsa if she could bring his some leaves from outside, so he could keep up his wind manipulation training, but quickly realized that the leaves would ignite as soon as he touched them. And so he spent the rest of the morning sitting in his bed just watching the queen of the country filling out forms of paperwork. The sight actually reminded Naruto of the times when he was younger and he would sit in the Hawkage's office and watch the old man work. Even though he liked all of the old pleasant memories from when he was a kid, Naruto felt helpless as he watched Elsa work. He had always hated being stuck in a bed and not able to train, but now not only couldn't he train but he also couldn't find a way home. In all honesty he liked it here but he wanted to try and get home. When he had been lying on the ground burning up from his fight with Kaguya all that Kirama had been able to say was that something drastic needed to be done to save his life. At the time all that was said was that Naruto needed to move somewhere to waste as much chakra as he could. And by move, that apparently meant anywhere. Naruto could be anywhere in the world, or even not on his world. But he wouldn't know until Kirama woke up and the two could talk. So for now he would just sit, wait, and enjoy the presence of his new friend. And that wasn't so bad he really liked Elsa. Despite not being able to talk with her, and having a village to run, she never pushed him off onto anyone else. Every morning she would walk into his room and smile at him. She would then check on his health, physically. Her soft hands would run over his body as she determined if his fever had gone down any. Her lithe fingers would trail over his muscles, while her piercing blue eyes followed his every movement. While Naruto greatly preferred spending time with Elsa he was always unsure of how he should react around her. 
She was just so physical. At first it was small things that he wasn't even sure Elsa noticed she did. When she was done with her examination she would drag her fingers up his chest and let them rest near his shoulders. When they were alone and talking together, if he seemed sad her hands would hold his. And when she left his room for the night, what started as a mere caress of his shoulders for the first few days, had recently turned into chaste hugs. He was confused. He had only received a few hugs over the years. Most of them had been from Sekiro or Tsunade after a dangerous mission. And it was usually after he woke up in a hospital bed. Much like his current situation where Elsa was keeping him bed bound. Although it was better here, because he was used to literally being bound to a bed, back in Konoha. However before Naruto could start contemplating Elsa tying him to the bed, said Radiant Queen broke him from his musings. He had been so lost in thought that he hadn't noticed that a servant had entered the room. Apparently Elsa needed to go out and wanted him to stay in bed. And while naturally opposed to confinement of any form, he agreed if for no reason other than he didn't want to worry Elsa. With a nod and a spoken thank you, Elsa was gone with the servant leaving Naruto alone in the room. While tempted to just leap through the window, Naruto stuck to his promise and stayed within the room, though he did open the window and sit on the sill. Maybe it was the time he had spent sitting on top of the Hawkage Monument, but Naruto had always loved being up high where he could watch over the village, and while not as high up as he was used to, he could see all of the village that Elsa presided over. It really was a beautiful place, from the ornately decorated houses to the small river that trickled into the valley from the mountains, with the cloudless sky only obscured by the billowing black smoke rising from behind the castle walls. Naruto had to do a double as the smoke began to rise. At first he had just believed it to be from a blacksmith, but the more he watched, the more he was convinced that it was actually a fire. With little thought to his previous promise to stay in his room, Naruto jumped from the window and landed across the courtyard on one of the walls surrounding the castle, and a second jump got him onto the peak roof of a larger building. His new vantage point afforded him a better view of what was going on, and he could easily see the large flame-licked building on the outskirts of the village. There was already a crowd of people moving towards the building, many of whom were carrying buckets of water. Others were moving hoses towards the sea. While there were a great many people helping to douse the flames, what caught Naruto's attention about the scene was that no one was coming out of the building. Having seen a few fires, Naruto was looking around for the family that had lived in the home, huddled together and happy with the knowledge that they were all safe. Instead Naruto saw a group of men trying to clear the way into the house. With a fear that there were still people stuck inside the blaze, Naruto sat down and began to meditate. While still impulsive, Naruto had grown over the past few years and knew that the best thing to do was to enter sage mode. With the life-sensing abilities, he would be able to locate where everyone was, run in, ignore the heat because his body was already hot, and leave with everyone, saving the day. If he did everything right, no one would even know it was him, and Elsa wouldn't find out that he left his room. As the orange pigment began to spread over his closed eyes, Naruto was able to sense a multitude of lives still stuck inside the burning building. However, instead of the wealthy family Naruto was expecting to own a house like this, he instead felt a large number of children hidden within the basement. There were a couple of adults scattered among the kids, obviously trying to keep everything calm. It was then that Naruto recognized the building for what it was, an orphanage, full of children as the building burned down over their heads and trapped in the basement, or they would be buried by the rubble if they couldn't get out soon. And it was to the sound of wood breaking that Naruto's eyes snapped open just in time to see the weakened building give under its own weight. The people of Arendelle had been hard at work for a while now. No one knew how the fire got started, but many blamed the hot weather. Even with their queen's snow powers, it was still hot, and they couldn't just have the queen blanket the town in snow again for fear that the crops would die. So when a fire broke out everyone was ready. It had been terrifying to learn that it was the orphanage going up in flames, but it was worse that the kids and the caretakers had gotten stuck inside. From what anyone could tell they were safe from the fire for now, but it was only a matter of time before the flames collapsed the building on top of them, and they would be stuck down there. Every available hand was present forming bucket lines as others helped run hoses towards the sea to pump water, many hoping that they could control the flames until the hoses were ready or the queen showed up. Several men had bravely started working on the doorway, hoping to clear it enough that the children would be able to escape. But fate worked against them as the creaking of wood sounded over the congregation. There was only enough time for the men nearest the house to run away as the house collapsed, sending a wave of embers and smoke over the area. The villagers could only look on horrified as where there was once the front wall of a building, there now rested the roof of said building. 
supported only by a few stray beams, keeping it from covering the entirety of the foundation. Many had started crying at the sight of the inferno. It was impossible for a normal person to even approach the flames now, let alone do anything truly useful. It was with silent resignation that those present began to pray. Some prayed that the queen would show up and freeze the fire. Others gave a more abstract prayer for a miracle to occur, anything at all that could save those trapped inside. While the queen would stop the fire, it might be too late, as the children suffered from the heat. And to the people, it was as if upon the wings of those prayers that a golden orange blur descended from the skies, breaking past the flames and crashing through the roof. And just as the smoke began to escape from the newly made hole, there was the deafening yell of a wild animal. The roar was only a precursor to a rush of wind that immediately followed, knocking over many to the ground as the air pushed against them. And with the wind went the air fueling the fire, snuffing the flames in one go. For once there had been a raging inferno of a building now stood only ruined remains. The few scant walls that had withstood the initial collapse were now gone, blown away with the fire thanks to the beastly wind. Only the roof remained as it fell where the house used to be, crumbling into itself. What seemed like years had in fact been mere minutes as everyone held their breath. Slowly, in the stillness of the gathering, the house moved. Where the ruined remains of the front door were, movement was clearly visible. Tantalizingly at first the roof shifted to the side, before stopping, and then it began to rise. At first all that could be seen was the color orange against the charred black of the building's interior. People worried if the flames had come back but were soon reassured as the bare torso of someone came into view, his arms following soon after, showing his fingers buried into the ashen wood of what used to be a support beam. Naruto's previous plan had gone from the complicated jump in, save everyone, and escape unnoticed, to the less complicated jump in, save everyone, and figure out the rest later. As soon as he had opened his eyes and saw the collapsing building, he was in the air, leaving a dent in the roof he had been occupying due to the force of his jump. Descending from the air he crashed down into the weakened roof, making a hole that dropped him onto the floor. Once on the ground Naruto had to shield his eyes from the blaze, while he barely registered the flames licking at his bare skin. Before he had even stood to his full height from his crouch, Naruto was trying to think of ways to disperse the flames enough that he could get the children out. It was due to his longing that he could ask Kirama for a suggestion that he remembered his fights alongside the giant fox. His thoughts focused on the aptly named Tailed Beast Shockwave, a move so powerful that it displaced air knocking projectiles and other jutsus away. If it was that powerful it should be able to blow out a raging fire completely, he theorized. However all of the times he performed the technique he was given chakra from Kirama, against his will or not, and at the moment all he had was using sage chakra, but both were a form of chakra so it should be okay. So with little thought to the word impossible, Naruto arched his back, sucked in what little oxygen there was, and gave a bellowing roar as he released all the sage chakra he had. The iris of his eye turned red for all of a second before changing to blue as the orange pigment from around his eyes receded, the chakra exploding out of his body, forming a dome of power blowing out the flames like candles. Ash and loose pieces of debris lifted into the air, as what remained of a solid structure groaned under the pressure before giving out causing what little was still standing to collapse entirely. Naruto just stood in the epicenter of the explosion, unharmed and uncaring that he had just destroyed a house to put out a fire. What mattered at the moment was making sure that everyone in the house was alright. And without Sage Chakra to locate anyone Naruto just relied on his eyes. Now that he was able to open his eyes Naruto found that the entirety of the house was pitch black, due in part to him getting rid of all the fire and destroying all the windows along with the walls. So now there was just a floor and a roof sitting on top of said floor. But without the crackling of fire, Naruto found that he could hear, and specifically he could hear crying. Tucked away in a corner of the wreckage was a small door nearly falling off its own hinges, a set of downward stairs visible behind it. Moving closer to the door and moving several beams out of the way, he cleared a path from what used to be the entrance hall of the building to what he guessed was the basement stairs, calling down to who he hoped were survivors, again forgetting the language barrier. He received a yell back, and shortly after the soot-covered face of an older woman poked out from the bottom of the stairs, finding words to be as useless as ever for him, Naruto began to wave the woman up hoping that the others down below would follow, take the steps two at a time and moving like a woman half her apparent age. She ascended the stairs at Naruto's beckoning, coming out into the destroyed remains of her home. She looked around for a while, before staring at Naruto, giving a quick thank you which he understood, the woman turned back to the stairs and gave a yell. Soon the small heads of children began to appear, making their own ways up the stairs as other adults guided them. 
With everyone looking well, Naruto began to busy himself with trying to locate an exit. Where he was known for filling in his plans as he went, Naruto had thought that they could climb out of a window before he took out all the walls. Now having really no other options he began to look around for a safe place to make another hole they could all crawl through. And finding no place that looked stable, he decided that he could just lift the roof enough that everyone could get out. It was only a half-burned roof, how heavy could it be to the greatest ninja ever? Elsa had been running towards the orphanage as soon as she had been told where the fire was, her dress flowing behind her as her heels clicking on the empty cobblestone streets. Whoever was able to help had already moved to the site of the fire, giving the queen ample room to run. She had just rounded a corner when a loud roar and a rush of wind pushed past her, billowing her gown. When the wind died down a few seconds later, Elsa took notice of the lack of smoke that filled the air only a few seconds ago and where once there was an abundance of yelling, was now replaced by an unsettling quiet. Redoubling her speed for the last few steps Elsa was greeted by the sight of what was once the orphanage, burned and destroyed, but no longer on fire. The townspeople standing around in silence as no one dared move for fear of breaking whatever spell had put out the fire. The first bit of motion came when the roof of the building itself began to move. Slowly the roof began to rise into the air. A pair of familiar orange pants came into view. By the time the roof was high enough that the lower half of a torso and a pair of arms were visible, Elsa already knew who was lifting the roof. A few tense seconds to readjusted his grip later, Naruto lifted the roof above his head showing his cold blue eyes as his hair shined golden through the soot that covered him. And with the roof over his head and supported, from around his legs came the running forms of children. The caretakers following behind, bent low to avoid his arms. With everyone out and away from the wreckage, the blonde stepped forward as the roof fell out of his hands crashing to the ground behind him kicking up more ash and dust around the stranger's legs. As the particles settled again there he stood, to the villagers he looked like a monolith of strength as he began to calmly walk towards the town people. To many he was a god amongst men and a savior of children, yet he looked no more extraordinary than any of them. He stopped about halfway to the gathered people, silently watching. While the townspeople checked on the children Elsa began to walk around the gathering, drawing a few odd murmurs from the crowd. It was only as she passed her people and began to walk towards her fellow blonde did all present take notice of her, including Naruto. While he looked worried, most likely since he wasn't in his room where she told him to stay, Naruto stood tall. His form was covered in soot and his skin took on a red tint, only letting the scar over his heart shine through like a badge signifying his will to survive. The special pants that were made for him seemed fine so she wasn't going to worry about those. She spent several seconds looking him over, trying to give her softest smile to show that she wasn't angry he left his room. Naruto just watched her, scratching the back of his head nervously. It was only when the small form of a young girl ran up to him and wrapped her arms around his leg that either of them were broken from their thoughts. While Elsa had noted that he was wearing his heat-resistant pants, she didn't want anyone to get hurt from accidentally touching him. She moved to intervene. Placing her hand on Naruto's shoulder to stop him from moving she kneeled down so she was eye-level with the girl and smiled sweetly at the child. Standing she turned to address the crowd. Everyone this is Naruto. He is my guest at the castle, but he is very sick with a fever so we must be careful when touching him or letting him out. Many people started to whisper to each other, none really sure what to make of the strange man. Some had seen their queen bring him into the village on a sleigh of ice. But while rumors had spread, no one had really been sure who he was other than a guest of the queen. While the crowd were discussing their newest resident, Elsa turned towards a group of soldiers and instructed them to gather all the doctors they could and bring them to the palace. When asked why, she reasoned that the grand hall would be large enough to hold all the children and adults who needed to be looked at, and after everyone had been checked over there was also enough room in the castle for them to stay in, until a new orphanage could be built. Upon hearing that many of the children started yelling in excitement, forcing the caretakers to move try and calm the excitable children down, although they were just as happy with the arrangement. Elsa just smiled at the exuberant children, and the perplexed look that Naruto now had as a result. He was probably confused by the dancing kids. However, this did bring about a new problem for the queen, mainly how she was going to transport everyone to the castle. Thankfully, luck seemed to be on her side as Anna, Sven, and Kristoff with his sleigh showed up at that moment. Getting everyone loaded onto the sled took a while, and some of the younger caretakers and older children insisted on walking to give more room. With everyone on and now moving towards the castle, Elsa could turn her attention to her fellow blonde, who had at least not run away. 
As was becoming customary between the two, she smiled, grabbed his hand, and began to lead him back to the castle. Ignoring some of the catcalls from the still-in-view children, she began to wonder if Kai had returned to the castle with the book yet. Because if he hadn't it was going to be difficult to explain to Naruto that the orphans were going to be staying with them. Especially now that he was walking around on his own, which she needed to question him about. Giving a sigh at the long day ahead of her, Elsa gave one last look at the wrecked orphanage, and on a spur of the moment thought cast a wave of freezing wind towards the house, just to be sure, and unknowingly putting out the small embers that still remained from where Naruto had grasped the wooden frame. But what Elsa didn't know, and Naruto only felt as a tickle in the back of his mind was that deep inside Naruto, a slitted crimson eye fluttered open before closing again. Did you see the queen's guest? A woman asked her friend as the two walked down the main street, all around them people whispering the same topic. That being the strange blonde that had saved the orphanage. The sun was now setting as only a few hours have passed since the incident. But already the talk of the town was the new blonde and what his relation to the queen was. Many wild rumors and theories already resounded throughout the streets, from the simple and mundane to the wild and exotic. With each new rumor came a different telling of how the mysterious Naruto saved the children. Everything from what could be considered as the actual story, all the way to the young man having the same Ike powers as the queen. And everybody had their own opinions on the matter. He looks like a wild beast, the friend of the first woman said quietly. Any friend of the queen was not to be insulted lightly. I was told that he had whiskers like a cat. He's apparently a foreigner with a large scar over his heart. The first woman replied. Do you think he comes from the Southern Isles? I heard there's been unrest ever since last year after Hans failed coop here. The butcher's wife told me that Scar is where the trolls pulled his heart out. Do you mean he's not human anymore? More like he doesn't fear death now, so he was able to walk into that fire with no fear at all. So the queen is trying to heal his missing heart, and in return for her kindness he'll protect the town right. That's what the baker said, so this means we have a genuine hero in town who'll protect us. The queen would never let anyone dangerous into our kingdom, so he must be a nice young man. All in all the town was happily chatting amongst itself, even if some of the theories being spoken about were of the far-fetched variety. Meanwhile at the end of the main street inside the walls of the castle itself, things were only beginning to quiet down. What had once been the great hall had now been covered with all forms of sleeping bags, blankets, and cushions. Many children loitered around the hall and its connecting corridors. The caretakers from the orphanage, with the help of the castle staff, tried to keep order. But the prospect of a sleepover in the castle was too exciting a prospect for the young children. And this is where the queen, her sister, her sister's boyfriend, and an overheating guest she was tending to are now trying to help keep some form of peace. Once all the children had been led around the castle, letting them marvel at the pictures and wonder of the palace, as they ran through the halls, everything had calmed down enough for dinner to be served. It was a simple meal due to how many mouths there were to feed, but everyone enjoyed it. So after many tough hours the sun began to set and the Queen of Arendelle was finally able to sit down behind her desk, currently in Naruto's room and relax, while vehemently trying to ignore the once again shirtless blonde doing squats. Maybe this is how he relaxes, the young queen pondered, finding herself watching him exercise despite her wishes for him to take it easy. Every so often she would send a quick blast of freezing air in his direction, not only to help keep him cool but also as a reminder that he shouldn't overexert himself. Naruto would only continue to push himself, but every chilling wind sent his way caused him to at least turn and give a bright grin. If she didn't learn to communicate with him soon her hair would turn white as the virgin snow. With a tired sigh the queen put away the papers she had been looking at and instead picked up the translation dictionary Kai had gotten, and began to leaf through some of the pages. Near the front of the book were the messy scribbles of the sailors, who had jotted down many words they wished to have ready at all times. The common hellos and other pleasantries, that Elsa quickly committed to memory, were followed by a quick guide to numbers and other such stuff that the merchants had a use for. These words gave the young queen a useful place to start at least trying to understand what her guest was talking about. They also gave her a better insight into what she had already learned, specifically the odd suffixes he would add on to names. She had to hide a small blush as the merchants noted that Chan seemed to be for young beautiful girls. Memories of all the times that word seemed to follow her name, even after he started calling her Haim, turned her face pink. Shaking her head to return her cheeks to their pale hue and calm herself down, the queen decided to get some help from a native speaker. Calling Naruto over was easy enough, but trying to explain that she wasn't angry about him exercising proved to be a bit more problematic. Once the shirtless blonde was seated across the desk, Elsa began trying her best to explain what she was doing. 
This mainly involved saying foreign words with much help from her confused friend. Slowly but surely the queen was able to get through the first few words that she felt would be handy to have, although her pronunciation apparently left much to be desired. With enough practice and a lot of help, she should be able to figure out how to speak Japanese, although it would be much better if Naruto were to learn her language instead. If he did the excitable blonde could speak with the people of the town and make friends outside the walls of her old room. It was strange really, how she and Anna had grown up shuttered within the castle walls so that she could learn control of her powers while her sister healed from the blast of ice to her head. But now that the doors were always open here she was keeping this man locked up inside. It clawed at her heart how so short a time ago her only comfort came from the locked gates. Yet now, as she had done for so many years, she was keeping someone locked away. First with Anna and now Naruto. The only difference from back then was that it had been Elsa herself who had been a danger to everyone, and now it was another blonde entirely. Even if her father had been the one to order the gates closed, it had all been done because of her, and now she was the one giving the order. As the queen's thoughts turned inward she became quiet. The midsummer wind from an open window hissed against her naturally cold skin. A soft chill began to fill the room, as fractals of ice and frost began to dance around trying to bring comfort to their queen's aching heart and yet it was fire that stilled everything and brought peace. Her hand had laid empty on the desk, but was now being held by another. A warm feeling spread upwards to her heart as she looked up to meet the sparkling sapphire gaze of her friend. He leaned forward his golden hair catching the last of the day's light, as his bright smile broke the self-imposed trance her own thoughts had instilled. The young woman's heart stilled as their faces moved closer together. The once comforting cold that had previously filled her body now felt constricting freezing her in place. There was only a hair's breadth between the two now, and the queen's breath caught in her throat when an all-cleansing fire burst forth inside her as Naruto closed the distance and laid his forehead against hers. All the anxiety and sorrow she had built up seemed to burn away from the contact. Nothing but contentment remained. Elsa didn't know how long she sat there, staring through her fellow blonde's eyes. Yet for all her years that followed nothing felt as long or pure as those few seconds. And so it was with a cold heart but light shoulders that she felt him pull away. That ever-present smile on his face. A small grin tugged at her own lips after the tender moment. However she quickly dissolved into full-out laughter at the sight of the man sitting across from her giving a thumbs up and looking like he had just solved the greatest mystery, if the smile on his face was anything to go by. Getting her chuckles under control Elsa stood from her chair and stretched. A small bit of herself took some joy in Naruto's gaze following her movements, especially when she was arching her back or bending over to pick up the dictionary from the desk. A little revenge and or motivation for adding Chan to her name. She would figure out which one later. With the day over and all the work she was going to get done finished, the young woman bade goodnight to her guests and began to leave for the night. However something stopped her as she stood in front of the door, a feeling that she should at least do one more thing before she headed to bed. Turning on the balls of her feet and looking towards her fellow blonde, the queen gave a soft bow and a heartfelt thank you in reference to his actions at the orphanage. Being the first words the two shared she knew he understood and hopefully could figure out what he was being thanked for. However before Elsa could make it past the door's threshold the scraping of a chair being pushed back quickly as well as Naruto calling out, caused her to stop and turn around again. He stood in front of her with his right fist held out to her and had a large grin on his face. When she continued to stay where she was the superheated man brought both his fists together making the knuckles touch before moving them back again. With his demonstration finished he once again held out his right hand, fingers curled, with an expectant look in his eyes. Believing she understood what he wanted and seeing no harm in a little more skin contact, the queen moved forward. Maybe this was just a way of signifying friendship over in Japan, or possibly it was used as a greeting. Have a more interactive form of welcoming each other would be nice. After all the two of them couldn't really talk with one another at the moment, so they had to express themselves with gestures, and this could work perfectly with the more physical relationship they shared. Elsa lifted her dominant hand, her left, towards his closed fist and lightly tapped her knuckles against his. What happened next would forever be burned into the queen's mind bringing comfort to her coldest nights and making the brightest days she would spend with her family that much warmer. Feelings of hope and determination welled up inside her, embedding themselves deeply inside her heart. Just as quickly as it came the feeling passed and the two once again stood quietly in the darkening room. Somewhere within the infinity of that experience, their fists had unfolded and their palms now rested against each other. Her smaller and soft hand was dwarfed by the calloused and work-scarred paw that pressed against her own. 
Each ridge and crevice that marked his skin flowed together in a dance of hard work and self-sacrifice. She understood him now and felt that he knew her just as well, letting all that he believed show through. And for his desire to protect his precious people, with all the pain that it had brought onto him, she hugged him. It was the day after he had rescued the orphans, and while happy about that, Naruto was bored. And the day had started out so interesting as well. For starters Elsa had actually brought him out of the room. Ever since the tour he figured she would return to insisting that he stay near his frozen bed. Maybe she was finally beginning to figure out that he healed quickly, and that you shouldn't contain him to one room. Tsunade Bachan and Shizun had been like that when he was younger. Sure it was different now, with the whole everything he touched caught fire, but he could be careful. And all the kids he saved seemed to like having him around. The older ones watched him with amazement, and the younger ones would follow him around. Especially that little girl who had ran up and hugged his leg yesterday. She stayed particularly close to him, but at least stayed far enough away that she wouldn't be burned. The little girl, whose name he wouldn't dare try and pronounce, reminded him greatly of a young Mogi from back home. It was kind of endearing how she kept so close to him, as long as she didn't turn into a fangirl. So with the early morning spent inside his room while his friend did some of her paperwork, and the rest of the morning until lunchtime spent with the children things were great. Even Elsa seemed to be in better spirits today. He had grown worried last night when she had gone quiet, and he even went so far as to check her temperature like the nurses did back home. When he had placed his forehead against hers he couldn't really tell how she was doing due to the natural cold that seemed to follow her, but she did perk up afterwards so that was good. And she had even thanked him before she left, although that was probably for everything that had happened that day. He wasn't really sure. Admittedly he was still worried about her when she got up to leave. Especially since she had been acting strange while gathered up her papers. She kept turning to look at him as if she was expecting some reaction as he watched her. Although what that was he didn't really know. He was scared that she had been making sure that he wasn't staring at her too much. And he tried not to but she was really beautiful. The sway of her hips had been more distracting to him than any of those girls Aro Senen had wandered off with. But when she had thanked him and turned to leave he could have sworn that he could see sadness in her eyes and didn't want her to go like that. So he had called out to her and extended his fist in friendship like Super Gramps Hagoromo had taught him. What followed after brought a dopey smile to his face and got rid of some of the boredom. But that was last night, and he had to face the unfortunate truth of the present. Naruto Uzumaki was back in school, sitting near the back of a room, inside the castle, that had been converted into a set of classrooms for the displaced children. Naruto was doing his best to try and stay awake. It would have been easy enough for him to escape through a window, but every time he thought about doing so he would look towards the far corner where a certain red head was keeping watch over him. He had been looking forward to playing some more with the kids after lunch, but as soon as he put down his bowl Elsa had shown up with Anna, who he assumed was either a close friend or the queen's sister. The exuberant girl didn't act like a princess, but neither had some of the royals he'd met. Taking his hand in hers his fellow blonde took him towards a rather distant room where some chairs and desks had been placed. Once he was sitting and some of the younger children had occupied the other seats. The older woman he had first met inside the destroyed orphanage came in with a stack of papers. It was at this point that he figured out that he was in trouble. What followed was terrible and awful, at least to him. He was forced to write out strange symbols in a repeating pattern. At least that wasn't too difficult, thanks to calligraphy lessons used for sealing. But once he had finished the teacher would point at one of the shapes and proceed to make a noise. Eventually Naruto figured out that they were teaching him their language, and that each symbol he had just drawn was related to a noise. Now that he knew what they wanted him to do he actually tried to put in a bit of effort, even if it was still boring. At least Elsa would appreciate the effort and would enjoy having someone to talk to, especially given how lonely she looked while working at her desk. Thankfully the lesson ended, not soon enough, and Naruto was led out of the room by Anna. The young students stayed in their seats and waved goodbye, with the blonde happily waving back, before moving on to their next lesson. Being brought back to his room where the ever-busy queen was working hard his red-headed guide gave a hug and some words to his fellow blonde. He was starting to think they were probably sisters. Once the two girls had finished, and Anna had left with a smile, Elsa motioned for him to take a seat across from her while she finished signing a few papers. As he sat and waited for whatever was to come next, the dictionary on the desk gave him a clue. He watched as the queen finished her work. Naruto was admittedly a little embarrassed that he had just noticed that Elsa was left-handed when they had bumped fists last night. 
although truthfully he only learned that Sasuke was left-handed when old man Hagoromo asked him and the bastard for their dominant hands. Naruto kun Elsa called out before the blonde could fall back into his memories, however he was now distracted by her word choice. Seeming to have finished her work, the queen had picked up the dictionary and was now sitting with it open. She had obviously been reading it and had picked up some of the honorifics. He would have told her that she didn't need to use them, but he doubted she would understand. So if she was going to try and learn some of his language why couldn't he? After all he was the greatest ninja to ever live. In truth though he wished he could just use his shadow clones to learn everything faster. But they might burn any books they picked up to read. Also from what Kirama had told him before they came to this world his body was burning off chakra and would need time to readjust. So it was probably a good idea to not use any chakra heavy techniques until Fuzz but told him otherwise. Speaking of, where was Kirama? It had been a good day for the Queen of Arendelle. There were no more fires and she had gotten some work done, mostly due to the fact she wasn't being distracted by Naruto being in the room. She gave another silent thanks towards her sister for agreeing to watch over him during his first language lesson, especially since it had been Anna who had come up with the idea of putting Naruto into the class when some of the children had been disappointed that they still had to attend their lessons despite the orphanage being gone. Many of those sorrows had been dealt with for the younger children when it was revealed that Naruto would be joining them for class. According to Anna he had at first only done so begrudgingly, but eventually began putting some effort in. Probably once he had figured out he could then talk with other people. From what she had seen, once he was brought back to his room, her fellow blonde was putting in quite the focus to at least learn some of the more common phrases, which pleased her greatly and gave her hope for the future. Although what had made her the happiest was the surprised look Naruto got on his face when she started adding the kun suffix to his name. The merchant's notes in the book stated that kun was the male equivalent of chan. One of the more crass sailors noted that it might be something akin to flirting. For now just calling Naruto something different from what everyone else called him felt fun and more personal. Almost like she had a pet name just for him. And given how fox-like he was with his penchant for running off on his own maybe she should put a collar and leash on him. Try to stifle a laugh as the young queen stripped for bed she dismissed the idea as a bit silly. However as she sat on the side of her bed and began to slide under the sheets a stray thought entered her mind that it would be nice if he wore a hat or some kind of headband to keep his bangs out of the way of his beautiful eyes. She would have to think about that more in the morning. Maybe once she remembered to take him to the gallery so she could use the portraits as teaching aids. But she would worry about that latter, since for the moment the more physical relationship she shared with Naruto felt fine. The kingdom of Arendelle had been caught by a sudden storm that had already blanketed the town with a heavy snow. Many of the residents were quickly making preparations for the cold. Logs were carried inside to be used on the fire, while mothers drew the curtains closed to keep the chill out, only for little hands to open them back up as the children wished to watch the last ship come into port a large merchant ship that had been gone for several months on a trade mission. The crew eager to make land and see their friends and families again, while catching up on these wild rumors they had been hearing. Unfortunately the storm had made that difficult as it had become treach hours to navigate through the fjord. The sailors struggling to keep their vessel steady as the rough waters pushed them farther from land. On a pier stood the magnificent Ice Queen Elsa, hair thrashing about in the winds of the storm. Her hands held high as the gales and waves calmed for the ship. The crew's spirits soared at the sight of their queen standing up to Mother Nature herself. While not able to completely stop the storm on her own, as the commander of ice and snow she would still make sure that all of her subjects were safe. Yet for how much she tried to keep the weather calm, the ship continued to flow farther off course. However a sudden flash of color caught everyone's attention. Sailors pointed towards the docks, while children pushed their faces against windows of their homes trying to get a look. Standing on a jetty wearing a pair of orange pants and shirt with a long piece of rope wrapped around his body was a lone blonde man. The snow seemed to dissolve around him, leaving a dome of empty air around his form. Before anyone could comprehend what he was doing he jumped into the sea with no fear for his life. The waves crested over him and he was soon unseeable by all until he resurfaced a few seconds later. His strong arms carried him closer towards the vessel each powerful stroke moving him against the raging water. Soon he was close enough to the ship and tossed the rope towards the deck where several sailors grabbed and tied it down. With one end attached the blonde gave a firm tug causing the boat to lurch forward. Satisfied that the rope had been firmly tied down, the young man began to swim back towards the shore, instead of climbing onto the ship like everyone had thought he would. Back on land he began to pull on the taut line. Smoke rose from the rope as his hands left a burn mark on each bit he held. 
his feet firmly against the ground as each tug brought the vessel closer. It was a slow progress against the waves, but at least the ship was no longer moving farther away. After a few minutes several dock hands arrived and began trying to lend any aid they could. Although their efforts merely eased the burden on the lone man, more than they actually helped. Eventually the ship had been pulled closer to the land and the sailors on the ship began to throwing lines towards several waiting dock workers. With the ship secured and all the sailors eagerly disembarking, the people still made sure to look towards the lone blonde who had jumped into the water. All of the villagers made sure to give him plenty of space as he stood there panting, many of them aware and cautious of the heat surrounding the now-soaked man. With the clicking of heels everyone was alerted as someone approached. The Queen of Arendelle made her way towards the group of men as quickly as she could, without looking undignified. Once in range she began sending gusts of ice towards the man, not caring that it had fallen below freezing in the late fall evening. As their ruler began to talk to the orange-wearing man, some of the sailors began to speak with the dock workers. The seamen, who had been away from home for too long, were curious if the man who had saved them was the rumor they had heard about while out at sea. The infamous fiery beast of Arendelle, a creature who, while human, is said to be so strong that he lifts houses and has a roar that can knock grown men to the ground. He has a power that radiates from his body and is so intense that it ignites the air around him. A man of fire that could only be controlled by the Empress of Ice and Snow herself. Or so the rumors say. Yet now, none of the sailors knew what to think. It was hard to tell if their queen had sent blasts of cold air at him as a scolding or for another reason. The man didn't seem that dangerous. He stood before the ruler of the land, hands scratching the back of his head, and repeatedly apologized for doing something so reckless. He seemed to be a vastly different man from the one that had jumped into the freezing ocean just a few minutes ago, giving one final check to make sure that everyone had disembarked safely. Elsa began giving out orders for the ship to be unloaded, and then for everyone to get home where their loved ones were waiting. The workers began pairing off, while the queen began turn back towards her castle. As she left the mysterious man followed right behind. He stood far too close to her for many people's tastes, believing that the queen should at least be given more space to walk freely. Although she didn't seem to mind, in fact acting like she enjoyed it. Even going so far as to join the blonde as he started waving at the many children staring through the closed windows, all of whom waved back. He's popular with the kids, one of the dock workers said, noticing a sailor watching. They see him as a hero and never miss a chance to watch him do something. It's just a shame that the queen only just let him leave the castle recently, now that winter's coming. The sailors who heard the statement could only watch as the duo continued to walk farther away from the docks. No one was really sure what to make of the situation. Their queen was capable of controlling this man that had rumors surrounding him, and yet he seemed no more extraordinary than anyone else. Elsa couldn't keep the smile from her face as she walked down the roadways towards the castle. Standing beside her, and acting a little silly, was Naruto. He would wave at the children or do something odd to make them laugh from behind their windows. It had been a strange few months, but she wouldn't have changed them for anything. While she still spent as much time as she could with her sister Anna, the queen now found her time split between keeping the land orderly and dealing with two overly energetic people. While Elsa took great care to help Naruto understand that he should stay inside until he was well again, her sister would constantly demand that they should be outside enjoying the nice weather while they could. All reminders about the overheating boy's condition were ignored. This would usually result in the red-headed princess leading her sister towards some far-off field that she had discovered, where they would enjoy a picnic lunch. Her boyfriend Kristoff would tag along to carry the basket and all other items for such an event. And to make sure he wasn't left alone, Naruto was usually brought along. Elsa really worried about her fellow blonde, mainly with his lack of friends in this new place he had found himself in. She felt that if he could at least learn the language before the seasons turned cold, it would be fine if he ventured out of the castle on his own, hopefully to make friends without the her own royal presence complicating things. People tended to act a lot more formal whenever she was present, and that usually made all conversations stiff and overly proper. This meant that she had waited and kept Naruto separated from the rest for the village until he could hold a conversation by himself. She could have let him out under the guardianship of Anna, but for as much as she loved her sister, leaving the ever-spirited redhead alone with the enigmatic blonde seemed like a recipe for disaster. The queen shivered at the thought of what her sister could convince the displaced blonde to do. Before Elsa could get any farther into her thoughts a sudden warmness enveloped her, as the man she was thinking about was now walking right beside her. Apparently her thought-induced shiver had been mistaken for one meant to shake off a sudden chill, and he was trying to warm her up. 
the two shared a grin at each other, both well aware that she took little discomfort from any kind of cold weather, but the action was appreciated. Although it did worry her that he was still so hot that he could warm people up just by standing next to them like this. She had hoped that his so-called fever would go down over time as he got better, but instead it had remained at the same temperature since he had first arrived. If he hadn't been so full of life she would have been worried, but for the life of her she couldn't find anything wrong with him. Maybe he was the same as her, only with fire and heat. It would explain why he continued to overheat despite everything. Elsa had heard some of the villagers discuss the strange blonde, and according to rumor there were a few who even believed that he had started the fire at the orphanage during the summer. Of course anyone that had watched the him interact with the children he had saved that day would instantly change their minds. Naruto had spent as much time as he could around the orphans, from trying to communicate with them in some way, to showing off an odd feat for them. The castle had never been so lively while the children had been living there, not even when Anna and Elsa had been children themselves. However, a couple months ago, on a bittersweet afternoon, the town's newly built orphanage had been opened and the castle was quiet once more. No one had been sadder about the departure than Naruto and young Ingrid, the fearless young girl who had run up and wrapped herself around her savior's leg. Ever since that first day the two had been inseparable, and spent every moment they could together. This ranged from eating, to lessons, and even a few of the private sessions in which Elsa would try to teach individual words from the dictionary. At first the young girl had been hesitant to be alone in a room with her queen and blonde hero. But after a few days she began to get comfortable around the ruler of the land. That daily interaction ended when Ingrid had entered the new orphanage with the other kids. Of course the little girl could be seen around town with the whiskered blonde on occasion but with how little he was outside the castle they didn't get to spend as much time together. Now that winter was here, maybe the two of them could see each other more often. Of course Ingrid was younger than what Elsa had in mind for the kinds of people she wanted to befriend Naruto, but it was a good first step. Naruto smiled as he walked down the cobblestone road, the biting cold air clawing at him, as his soaked shirt and pants clung to his form. Yet he didn't feel the cold through the layer of heat that prevailed around him. Unfortunately no amount of body heat would stop the unpleasant feeling of walking around in wet clothes, something that was visible to the queen beside him. Are you alright Naruto? The platinum blonde queen asked. I am doing alright Elsa Heim. Her counterpart replied as well as he could. I just wish I did not have to walk around in these wet clothes. Tugging at his quickly drying, but no less unpleasant, shirt Naruto cursed as his decision to wear the clothing. The alternative of course was walking around without a shirt in the snow, and while the cold wouldn't affect him it still felt weird. Of course Naruto also didn't want to scare any of the children around the village with his Chidori scar on display, a habit he picked up after the failed rescue mission all those years ago. While not ashamed of the wound, having used it to motivate himself during his training trip, Naruto quickly discovered that others were not as enthusiastic about the vicious wound especially children like the Konohamaru Corps. Even Sakura had been a little squeamish before her medical training, although to the day he last saw her, she would avoid looking directly at it. Around the castle there were people who apparently knew about it, like Anna, who could on occasion be caught looking at his chest, with a curious yet sad expression. Naruto liked the princess of the land, who would spend time playing with the orphan children while they had been staying in the castle. She always seemed so happy and carefree whenever the redhead would run through the halls or take a trip into the village, although the spirited girl would on occasion get a far-off look on her face that confused the equally spirited blonde. Anna's boyfriend, Kristoff, was a little cautious around him, although that seemed to stem more from the man's own cautious nature than any kind of ill feelings. The ice farmer or harvester, it was hard for Naruto to understand his fellow blonde's job made sure that whenever they were around the superheated ninja to keep everyone at a safe distance. He also had an odd habit of holding Anna's hand when the two were around Naruto. A hand waving in his face broke the orange wearer from his inner thoughts, as the queen tried to get his attention. Were you thinking about home? She asked remembering the stories her fellow blonde tried to describe with his limited vocabulary. While not fully understandable the wide variety of tales he told were always entertaining. Naruto scratched the back of his head, a dopey smile on his face. While he hadn't been strictly thinking about home at that moment, it was most certainly hard to forget about his home and all that he had left behind. But for as disheartening as the thought was, Naruto had long since decided that there wasn't much use worrying about it until Kirama woke up and the two of them could discuss their options. Although the main problem was that the fox had yet to wake up since the two of them had arrived in Arendelle. 
No matter what he tried, nothing roused the giant chakra entity from its slumber, shaking his head no at his fellow blonde and sending the last of the water droplets from his hair at her. Naruto tried his best to avoid the topic with his response. I was thinking I would be dry if I had walked on the water. A few drops of now frozen water fell from Elsa's flame-like hair as she turned quiet. Whether she was confused or just thinking was difficult to say. Naruto chuckled at the look on her face before he began trying to explain what he meant. While difficult to get his point across, he told stories of having to walk over hot springs or risk falling into the scalding water. Grand battles that took place on the surface of the ocean with giant beasts. Every few minutes Elsa had to help him with a new or difficult word, taking tender care to listen to his story and understand what he was saying. Not only to enjoy the tale, but also to provide words based on nothing but context clues and gestures. A featherlight laugh escaped from the queen's lips at the image of her friend rolling around on the ground with his feet burned red from water. Soon the towering castle stood over them as the guards stood watch over the entrance, waiting for their queen and her guest ought return. The laughter from the two blondes was infectious as the staff couldn't help but smile at the two. A calm feeling of happiness that had been pervasive from the past several months hung in the air and helped to disperse the cold that accompanied the drifting snowflakes. A yell resounded throughout the castle as an angry frost crawled over the interior walls. An annoyed queen marched through the halls as she looked for a particular blonde. The bed and room he normally occupied were empty save for a note saying he was going out. Given he could barely speak the language, Elsa had a feeling that a certain princess might have helped him write it. Up on a hill away from the castle were a group of children having a wonderful time, chief among them being a princess and a displaced shinobi. The snowy slope was already covered with tracks as shouts of joy resounded through the air. Snow angels littered the top of the hill, one noticeably deep enough to show the ground underneath. Several sled trails headed towards the bottom where a camp had been set up ready for the children wishing to take a break before making the trek back up the hill, only to then slid back down again. At the center was a certain blonde, being used as a makeshift heat source during the cold winter day, Ingrid constantly sitting by his side. Other children huddled around warming their hands and bodies, while a certain red-haired princess had a different use for him in mind, mainly keeping warm the hot chocolate that she had brought. So there Naruto sat, a large container of warm choco nestled on his lap while the princess of the country danced around him with children. Laughter filled the air as everyone present had a great time playing outside. Fortresses were constructed and demolished across a dozen snowball fights as the afternoon moved on. Olaf even joined in. Being that he was made out of snowballs, the little guy felt perfectly justified in running around and jumping onto any poor soul he was near. Kristoff and Sven were in the mountains for the day harvesting ice, leaving the mountain man's girlfriend alone with the overheated blonde for the first time since he had arrived. Elsa was supposed to have some meeting today, so no one bothered to ask if she wanted to come along. Hopefully she wasn't too angry about not being invited, or that they had essentially snuck out. When twilight set in and flakes of snow began to fall, all the kids began returning home. Olaf following along as he got caught up in the movement of small bodies. It did take some convincing to get Ingrid to return to the orphanage, but a promise from the blonde to visit her tomorrow had her skipping off, leaving only Naruto, who was carefully packing a sled full of leftover supplies, and Anna who sat watching the stars appear. The princess smiled at the fantastic time she had over the day. Playing in the snow with Elsa as children had always been some of her favorite memories. Running out of the castle to take advantage of blizzards that would leave the hills perfect for sliding down. Afterwards they would take buckets full of snow into the castle kitchen where they would laugh and try to hit the posts and pans hanging from racks. It was memories like those that always brought a smile to the young woman, even if she was sure that most of them were lies. While the two princess would spend the day in a winter wonderland, they would drag their sleds back to a castle that was being decorated for a summer dance. The details on where they had been playing to find such snow was always a foggy subject. As a child Anna had either not paid attention to it, or just believed they had gone to the constantly snowy mountains for the day. Of course she now knew that would have been impossible, but it made sense back then. It honestly felt like over half of her memories from those days were in some kind of snowy paradise that she and her sister could enter and leave whenever they wanted. Of course now she knew that it was just Elsa's magic making the snow, but even with that realization why didn't she remember more? Of all the joyous memories she had most of them would blend together with how similar they were. There weren't many moments she could think of that involved the warm kiss of a summer day. Almost everything the two girls did seemed to be during winter. She knew that both of them had bicycles when they were young, but couldn't remember either of them going riding that often. 
Yet despite that, after Elsa had been isolated, Anna found she could ride her bike perfectly, spending her time pedaling around the courtyard and even the castle halls, gliding around with a well-practiced grace she couldn't remember learning. Plenty of ice skating and sledding, but very little riding their bikes through town. And that was what worried her the most. When Kristoff goes home for the day and Elsa turns in at night, Anna would find herself alone with just her memories. Memories she could no longer trust to be what actually happened between her and her sister. For those terrible sleepless hours she would wonder where the truth began and ended. Thankfully she didn't mind about the past all that much now that she and Elsa had reconnected. As a little girl locked outside her sister's door, the young princess had spent a lot of time with her thoughts, but now she had friends. Olaf and Sven were always fun to be around while her boyfriend Kristoff was such a gentleman. There was even Naruto, who was being super annoying as he waved a cookie in her face while she was having deep philosophical thoughts. Standing in front of her was the blonde, smirking down at her while holding a baked sweet just in front of her. Yet whenever she reached for it he would keep it just at her fingertips. Finally giving up she began leaning up farther, only for the blonde to grab her wrist with his gloved hand and pulled her all the way into a sitting up. Placing the cookie into her still outstretched hand, her companion took a seat across from her and began staring her down. Problem? He asked tilting his head slightly. Anna was confused for a second before figuring that she must have been showing her uncomfortable thoughts on her face. There's no problem. I was just thinking about something, she said waving her hands in front of her, almost losing the cookie in the process. Naruto's eyes narrowed in response, raising his finger and poking the girl in the forehead. Why are you sad? His words came out slow and measured. Anna was stunned, having expected the blonde to either leave the subject alone or be unable to understand what she had said. Maybe she should give him the benefit of the doubt and see if he could help her sort out her own thoughts. Having a new perspective on the matter might help. When I was young, she gestured with her hands trying to help him understand. My memories were changed, hopefully her words were simple enough to get. A few seconds passed before Naruto said anything, changed, not lost. He asked, trying to clarify for himself. That's right, Anna confirmed. My memories of one thing became something different. Which ones changed? Naruto prodded, seeming to have the basic idea. When I was young I knew about Elsa's ice powers, but those were changed after something happened. No one will tell me what that something was though. Anna muttered the last part, not wanting to confuse the boy any further. Subconsciously she found herself twirling a strand of hair between her fingers. Naruto had a puzzled expression on his face as he pieced together what he had been told. How do you know they were changed? He asked holding a thinking position. I asked Elsa about it, and she said dad did it years ago. She answered, I don't really know why though. So much for keeping that part secret. As the blonde went back to thinking, Anna silently hoped that he would give up and the two of them could return home. She enjoyed talking with the guy, but the princess wasn't really convinced that he could help her that much. It was kind of impressive that he could understand everything so well. Are the memories bad? The sudden question broke the girl from her thoughts. She gave a moment of pause, not having considered whether these changed memories were bad. No, she started off hesitantly. I remember having fun with Elsa as we played in the snow. She must have been using her powers, but I don't remember her using them at all. Were your original memories of having fun with Elsa? Oh yeah, I could never forget how great it was to hang out with her. Anna punctuated her statement by throwing her fist in the air, a renewed vigor to the redhead. Then what is the problem? On and froze mid-pose, not really expecting the question. I meant how you never forgot the good. It is just different than how you remember, Naruto clarified, hoping he hadn't said something wrong. He hadn't, but it still got Anna thinking. What really was wrong with having different memories than she felt she should have? No matter what, she and Elsa had been best buddies as kids, and now that the truth was out in the open, nothing was ever going to change that again. So what if she didn't remember Elsa having powers before her coronation? Now that she knew, everything had been going perfectly. I guess it doesn't matter really, Anna said, standing and dusting the snow from her skirt as she prepared to leave. My memories may be different, but what really counts is still there. Naruto smiled broadly at the happy princess. Standing up himself he watched as she danced around the clearing while he went back to the packed sled. A few seconds later and the duo were headed to the castle, a new blanket of snow already covering the ground. One short trip later and both of them were standing on the edge of the town, the dirt path they had been traveling on turning into a cobblestone street. Neither of them moved, just standing there taking in the quiet beauty of the village. Windows were closed from the chill as men carried a few more logs indoors to keep the fires nice and hot. At the far end were the spires of Arendelle Castle where Elsa was probably furiously wondering where the two of them were. 
else is going to be worried enough about where we were. Anna said looking towards Naruto, so let's not bother her with what we talked about. Okay, secret. Got it? Naruto smiled and gave a thumbs up, trying to show he understood. Truthfully though he was worried about the red-haired princess. During the walk back to the town he found himself constantly watching her as she joyfully bounced around the forest road. But, if you become sad talk with Elsa, the exuberant girl's shoulders drooped at the request and gave a small shake of her head. I don't think she would know how to help me in this situation. The young woman became quiet as she looked over the snowy landscape. Honestly, I'd probably get better help from the trolls. For as good as he had been doing in his studies Naruto was now confused. Trolls was a word that he had yet to learn, and given the already tense situation he would ask later. Although it was probably better to ask Elsa for clarification on any words instead of Anna. The princess could be less than ample at describing things in ways he could understand. If he had to guess, trolls were probably some kind of mind healer, akin to the Yamankas from back home, wherever that was, or perhaps when, as he had recently started to think. With Elsa having control of ice like Haku from the Yuki clan, and now people who could help someone with scrambled memories. The comparisons between his home and where he now found himself were starting to get annoying. Maybe he had ended up in the past, and this was before Kaguya was even born. Not likely, but also not improbable at the moment. Truthfully at this point Naruto figured that the only person who would know for sure was Kirama, and the giant fox still hadn't woken up. He knew the biju had said it would need to rest for a while. Yet after all these months the blonde was expecting at least some kind of a response from his partner. It was actually kind of worrying now. If these trolls, that Anna mentioned, were any good with mind stuff it might be a good idea to see if they could learn what was wrong with him. Although that sounded like a bad plan in general given that they probably didn't know the first thing about seals. So probably best not to go see them right away, and just ask Elsa instead. Speaking of the queen, Naruto and Anna were quickly approaching an impatiently waiting one. The snowflakes that were beginning to cover her head giving a nice contrast to the flame-like wisps of her hair. Although the absolutely stunning image she gave in the soft frosty downpour only seemed to accentuate how annoyed she looked. Anna, seeing the look on her sister's face, whispered an apology to her traveling companion, before running ahead, moving past the still glaring queen, giving a nervous chuckle along the way. The redhead threw herself into the arms of her boyfriend who had been waiting a few steps back, the couple immediately losing themselves in each other's embrace and ignoring the rest of their surroundings. Elsa sighed at her sister's antics, trying really hard to ignore the obvious kissing sounds happening behind her. She was happy that Anna had found someone to care so deeply about since they had opened the gates, but it was also a reminder that she herself hadn't found someone to spend that kind of quality time with. This being on top of the fact that she was still fending off marriage proposals from neighboring kingdoms and trade partners. It was getting harder to send responses that both declined the offer and didn't start any wars as the other countries started pushing for closer unity. Thankfully as trade and communications slowed down for the winter months, the Queen of Arendelle could take some time to sit down and enjoy the company of her friends and family. From Anna and the staff, to Kristoff, Sven, and Olaf the castle was always lively this time of year. Even the grinning blonde idiot standing before her, scratching the back of his head, could now be counted amongst that group. No matter how much she wanted to pull on his ear, yell at the top of her lungs, or make icicles hang from his eyebrows for disappearing on her like that. She couldn't, there wasn't a reason now that he was back. She worried about him and wanted him to get better. He was still burning to the touch, and had to walk around in his heavy clothes to keep from catching anything on fire. Yet with the cold weather, now would be the perfect time for him to lose some layers and start getting his fever under control. Hopefully then he could lead a normal healthy life, and not be stuck in a room like when she was younger. Without even realizing it, he had become precious to her. Did you have fun? Elsa asked struggling to keep her annoyed face on. The enthusiastic nod she got as a response was so comical she couldn't help the giggle that came out. Did everyone get home safe? She continued, another overly animated nod. Good, she tried to maintain her queenly stature in front of the goofy blonde, let's go home. She had to resist doubling over when the response she got was a thumbs up and a yosh sound. Whatever that meant, turning around she began moving toward the castle. The sound of a pulled sleigh behind her as the two walked next to each other into the castle. A small party was being held in the market square of Arendelle. A few of the braver villagers had decided to brave the cold winter morning to see off their queen and the mysterious blonde who had been helping out their town for the past few months. With the colder months slowing down business, Elsa found herself with more time to spend with her family. And while it was impossible to take every day off and go play in the snow, she made sure to make an appearance outside the castle when she had time. 
greeting the hardy people of Arendelle as they went about their snow-covered business. It was during one of these outings, as she was being accompanied by Naruto, that her blonde companion began asking about the trolls that lived in the mountains. At first the queen had been curious how he had come to learn about the magical rock people, expecting some story about Kristoff describing his family. Instead the superheated man insisted he had just heard about them from around the castle, and tried to deflect any further questions, although he did seem to look towards Anna during his explanation. While Elsa wanted to continue pressing for answers, she eventually relented and tried her best to explain the legend of the troll tribe that lived in the mountains. With several of the villagers, and the orphan girl Ingrid, around it wouldn't do for people to start thinking that there were actual trolls living nearby, and that they had magical powers to solve almost any problem. Thankfully it was easy enough to explain to Naruto that they were considered a myth, which he seemed to accept. Although when pushed on why he wanted to know he admitted that he was wondering if they could help him with something. What exactly he needed help with ended up being left unsaid. But Elsa was confident that he had been thinking about his temperature. For the next few minutes, as Naruto played with the village children, Elsa thought about the conversation. While the trolls had originally found Naruto, they had entrusted his well-being to her. Yet with everything she did nothing seemed to give him any kind of real life. Maybe it was time to go back to the trolls and see what Grand Pabby thought of the situation now. Once Naruto returned to her side a plan was quickly set out to go and visit where the trolls supposedly lived. During Elsa's next day off. Of course Ingrid and the other children had heard that their friend was going on a journey. And quickly set up a farewell party for the blonde. The fact that he should be returning that very night did little to calm them down. So a few days later found Naruto and Elsa, in the middle of a small gathering, ready to head up the mountain towards the rumored Troll Valley. Anna and Kristoff had already gone ahead, the ice harvester wanting to make sure that Pabby was actually there, leaving the queen and guests behind. Once the children had said their goodbyes and the few grown-ups gave another round of thanks for everything the shinobi had done, the two set out. The ride to the Troll Valley was one of the more enjoyable trips that Elsa had taken in recent memory. A small sleigh that only she and Naruto shared, pulled by her personal steed, plowed through the wintry countryside. A light snow had started to fall, with flakes so soft that Elsa doubted that she could have managed such a flurry at her most delicate. The clacking of horse hoofs against the trail resounded through the woods. Every so often a low-hanging branch would brush against the side of the carriage, causing the dangling icicles to knock against each other, adding to the frosty melody. Laughter soon joined the harmony as Elsa chuckled at a story of something Naruto had seen, involving Kristoff, Olaf, and a basket of fish. It's been a while since we've been able to talk like this, Elsa said once she had her breathing back under control. While I am learning the language we do not get to have a lot of alone time, Naruto responded, giving a firm nod. Elsa agreed that the two of them had been spending more time apart recently. With both his studies and seemingly improving health, her fellow blonde had been spending more time away from the ice bed that he now only slept in at night. While she still kept her desk within the same room it had become much lonelier without the boy there to keep her company. Even if she had been able to catch up on her work now that there were less interruptions. I sometimes miss sitting in that bed all day, talking with you, Naruto's surprise statement caught the queen off guard. Not having expected the usually energetic blonde to equate anything positive to the time she forced him to stay bedridden. It might have been a sign of his hidden maturity, or perhaps there was still a lot to learn about the enigmatic man. Elsa stiffened as her companion gave a loud yawn and leaned back in the bench seat, throwing his arms across the backrest, which also meant that he now had his arm wrapped behind her shoulders. Her blush found its way to her cheeks as she felt a soothing heat radiate off him. I have missed our talks too, she answered back, lowering her head to hide a smile. A gentle quiet fell over them as Elsa tried to think of a topic for them, preferably something easy enough for Naruto to understand, yet would provide a challenge to test his vocabulary. And as luck would have it a certain question had been nagging her for a few days now, and it was the perfect time to ask. Naruto, what did you and Anna talking about the other day when you were on your way back to the castle? The question came out stiffer than she had intended but she was curious about what the two had shared with each other. Not in a nosy kind of way, but more closely to a worried sister who knew what trouble the mischievous pair might get up to. The sleigh was quiet for a second. Before she could press farther the queen frozen as a warm hand held onto the back of her neck, slowly massaging away the journey's chill and the stress from her daily routine. Slowly the ache left her, hours spent leaning over a desk doing paperwork had left her constantly sore. The firm massages from her fellow blonde were becoming a more frequent activity between the two. Try not to work too hard, or else you will turn out like old lady Tsunade, Naruto said. Elsa would have been confused as to who he was talking about, 
but she was too busy enjoying the relief her body was getting. She was so relaxed that the reins controlling her steed almost fell from her grasp. Thankfully for the both of them Naruto noticed and stopped his ministrations before the two of them were at the mercy of the horse's judgments. Coming out of her blissful state, the Ice Queen sat up just a little straighter as she ordered her horse to continue marching towards the troll's valley. A smile and blush stained her face as she watched her companion return to his reclined position on the seat. Thank you for that Naruto, she twisted her neck slightly, enjoying the feeling of how loose it felt. But you're not getting away from my question that easily. Naruto's hand had already been on the move when Elsa voiced her question, and the display Shinobi saw no reason to stop, although it had given him some time to think about his answer. Anna was telling me about the trolls, he said simply, not wanting to go against Anna's request. And that's all. A delicately maintained eyebrow rose higher. Naruto smiled slyly, keeping quiet on the matter. The two had a staring contest each holding their own in the short match. Eventually the ninja flicked his sight ahead of them towards the road, causing Elsa's to follow in worry that there might have been something blocking the path. Thankfully there wasn't and the trail forward was clear all the way to the quickly approaching valley. By the time she returned her gaze to orange wearing blonde he was once again leaning back, this time with his eyes closed. The only thing that stopped her from putting her elbow into his side was the fact that as queen it would look bad if she did such an act. That didn't stop her from ordering her horse to take an upcoming curve more sharply than was necessary. Naruto cracked open one eye to send a glare her way before returning to his rest. A full minute of quiet passed. Talk with Anna about what happened, the suddenness of his words caught her off guard. She worries sometimes. Before any more could be said the shinobi stood in the small sleigh and jumped onto the road choosing to run the last little distance to where Sven was parked at the entrance to the troll's domain. Elsa was left alone as she continued on getting closer to the reindeer, his handler, and Anna, both of whom were smiling and waving at her in Naruto's arrival. The blonde queen wondered what her sister had to worry about if she could smile that brightly, but it couldn't hurt to talk with Anna just in case. Elsa paced back and forth inside the small clearing, a habit she had picked up from her youth when she had been locked in her room. Pabby the elder troll stood in the middle as Anna, Kristoff, a noticeably nervous Naruto, and a horde of trolls stood in a circle around them. After they had explained to Naruto that trolls were in fact real, and gotten him to promise not to punt any of them, the mountain dwellers spent several minutes examining the strange blonde. Bolda, Kristoff's adopted mother, took an immediate liking to the ninja, offering to cook him something the next time he visited. Naruto had a feeling anything he ate from her would resemble something that Ma would serve back on Mount Mayaboku. Unfortunately that was where the pleasantries ended as Pabby showed up with less than good news. While Naruto had made amazing progress in healing, the fact he could walk astounded the old troll. There wasn't much else that could be done for him. This is what led to Elsa's pacing. Are you sure there's nothing that you can do for him now? Elsa asked stopping in front of the elder. I'm sorry your highness. As I said when you took him from us there is a magic of his own that burns him, and none of our magic could help him. The forlorn look on the troll king's face spoke volumes of his displeasure at being helpless. Couldn't you pull out the magic? Kristoff contemplated, giving a sidelong glance towards his girlfriend. Anna wasn't really sure what was happening, but she did catch the look the ice harvester gave her at his mention of removing magic. While not sure what he was getting at, she did notice several other trolls looking towards her in the same way. Giving a shake to of her head to clear it, she decided to to not worry about the weird looks for now, and instead focus on the conversation. After all how would one go about pulling magic out of someone else? Her parents would have probably had it done to Elsa when she was younger if it was possible. Maybe the trolls sucked out the magic through a kiss. His magic is different from ours, and far more vast, Pabby answered as he moved closer towards Naruto. I'm afraid that we would not be able to remove enough magic from him if we tried. The gathering went quiet again. The humming of different people trying to think of a solution was only broken up by the soft clicking of Elsa's heels as she resumed her pacing. It was obvious that something unexpected needed to be thought of, or at least knuckleheaded. When you say magic inside me, you are talking about a type of power right? Naruto asked locking eyes with Pabby. The elder troll nodded in response. If I were to use up the magic myself, would that let me heal faster? Naruto, having decided that magic must be this world's word for chakra, felt that his suggestion made a lot of sense. No one there, except for the shinobi, had even been aware that Naruto could access whatever energy he held inside him let alone use it. Elsa had a feeling it was how he snuck around the castle, but had never gotten confirmation. Pabby stroked his chin, finding a lot of merit in the idea. That would most likely work if you could expel the excess energy in a safe way. Over time you could, most likely, lower your temperature, he said. 
Is there any reason you think it might not work? Naruto blinked at the elder's words, only having understood about half of them. Yet it sounded like an endorsement for his plan, and he understood the question at the end. Before I woke up here I was in a large fight. He started off. A loud yelp from Elsa went unheard as everyone listened to the blonde's tale. The queen did as well, but also found herself thinking about her new friend having been in a battle of some kind, and the scar on his chest. During the fight I used a lot of magic, and it started to burn. Naruto continued trying, to the best of his abilities, to explain the situation that brought him to Arendelle. Without mentioning any giant demon foxes, he needed to talk with Kirama before that piece of information had to be explained. Interesting, Pabby said, going silent as he thought. A few minutes later he had the makings of a basic plan. If using your magic causes you to heat up, there is a good chance that if you were to try this you might get worse. Naruto scratched at the back of his head. I was worried about that, so I used as little as possible until I had gotten better. Pabby chuckled at the response. We can avoid that if you release your magic somewhere really cold. How about Elsa's ice palace? Anna shouted out. It's near the peak of the North Mountain and would give him some place to sleep during the night. We don't know how long this will take, so putting him in a spot that we know would be beneficial, Elsa chimed in. While she didn't like the idea of leaving Naruto alone in the palace, she and Anna would have duties to perform down in the village, and Kristoff had his job as an ice harvester, meaning anywhere they took Naruto he would have to be left alone. This was probably the best compromise if it meant getting her fellow blonde healed. There's still plenty of time to head up there this afternoon before coming back down, Kristoff added. I even have some supplies we can leave up there with him until tomorrow. Several of the trolls began to give suggestions. Some mentioned better routes to take, while others went off and gathered even more provisions to take to the ice palace. Naruto, on the other hand, had been unable to follow the conversation since Anna had cut in. But whatever was being planned seemed to be thoroughly taken care of. This left Naruto with time to look around the valley that he had been sitting in for the past little while. Specifically he was curious about the circle that seemed to be carved into the very rock beneath him. While having never received an extensive education on sealing techniques, he had seen enough to recognize the similarities the circle had, especially with the summoning jutsu. Young man, the words bork Naruto from his examination as Pabby walked towards him. With all of this commotion I had almost forgotten to ask if this was yours. The old troll held out his hand, and laying in his rock palm was a simple piece of metal. A symbol was etched into the front of it, while the burned away remnants of a black cloth were attached to the back. Naruto was quick to grab hold of it. Thank you for finding this, he said holding it to his chest. Pabby laughed. I like to think you merely left it here while you were recovering. The troll stated as he stood next to the shinobi, both watching the others finalize their plans. I am glad that you found some friends in this place who are so willing to help you. Naruto stared forward. Elsa and Anna had taken to loading Kristoff's sleigh with what looked like a woven grass bag of potatoes. The mountain man was having a mock conversation with his reindeer friend, and every troll was moving around their home with practiced ease. They are precious to me, was all he said with a large grin. Pabby laughed in agreement. Snow flew up against the sides of the sleigh as the group of four, plus one reindeer, journeyed farther up the mountain. Elsa, Anna, Kristoff, and Naruto rode in the ice harvester's sled as the peak of the North Mountain slowly came into view. Simple conversations were held as they moved steadily onward. Anna had taken an interest in some of the stranger food that had been packed for the blonde's stay in the ice palace, most specifically a sweet-tasting cracker that Kristoff refused to say what it was made of. Elsa stared out at the snow-covered countryside, seeming lost in the beauty of it all, a content smile on her face. Eventually the sun passed its highest point, and the group decided to take a break. Pulling up to a frozen lake everybody disembarked, even unhitching Sven so he could wander around. Although the reindeer spent most of his time getting strands of ice stuck in his horns. On one side of the lake was a cliff, a small waterfall draining into the body of water. Naruto found himself sitting against the rock face, holding out his hand to let the cold liquid wash over him, as thoughts of his home came to the forefront of his mind. Holding his palm against the water Naruto pushed his chakra against the cold trickle. A second later in the waterfall split, cut off in mid-air. Memories of the days he spent practicing his wind chakra brought a smile to his face. Naruto, Elsa called out to her fellow blonde. We're ready to continue now. The rest of the group had gathered at the sleigh, ready for the rest of the journey up the mountain. When the queen had called out to him Naruto was so lost in thought that his concentration slipped and he spiked his chakra, causing the water to splash outward, covering his hand and soaking the cuff of his jacket. Flicking his teeth and shaking his arm to dry it as much as possible, Naruto began making his way towards everyone else by the sleigh. 
decided to play in the water. Kristoff asked, taking in the foreigner's damp cuff. A nervous chuckle and a hand wave was the ice harvester's answer as the shinobi didn't want to explain what he had been doing. It was going to be bad enough when they reached this ice palace, and he would have to, with his limited vocabulary, describe how his magic worked. Naruto understood that the people of Arendelle were not ninjas. None of them used chakra, and only Elsa showed any kind of Naruto had noted, did cause some people to look at her differently, like she was separate from everyone else. She was forced to stand on ceremony as a queen on top of being seen as different with her powers. Elsa must have had a hard childhood. Kristoff jumped into the driver's seat as Anna snuggled in next to him, leaving Naruto to take a seat on Elsa's left, behind the couple. The two blondes patiently waited a few moments as they watched Ice Harvester and Princess spoke quietly to each other, getting lost in their love. The two sitting in the back tried to ignore the couple, wanting to give them as much privacy as they could, but found it difficult due to the close proximity. Eventually the sled gave a hard jerk and started moving startling the queen and her guests, who were too busy looking anywhere but forward. Elsa, unprepared for the sudden movement, grabbed anything nearby that could help stabilize her. Unfortunately what she grabbed happened to be Naruto's hand, causing the ninja to hold grasp back and make sure the queen was steady before he let go. The two looked at each other for a full minute, just sitting there with their hands clasped. After another bump from the sled, the two regained the composure and split apart, sitting back in the sled as it sailed along. As they moved along, Naruto took a look at the cuff of his jacket that had been soaked earlier. While his body heat had already dried most of the water off, there must have still been some moisture left. An intricate ring of crystalline ice spiked around his wrist from when Elsa had grabbed his hand. While he would never doubt the power of his friend, Naruto's curious mind wondered if his usage of such a small amount of chakra had lowered his temperature. The only way to really find out was for him to get serious once the group got to the ice palace. Naruto was having the best day since he had arrived in this world. He had spent the morning with Ingrid and the other village children. The sleigh ride up the mountain with Elsa had been great. His temperature was showing signs of dropping, and now he was fighting a giant snow monster. The sun had been well on its downward journey when the group arrived at a snowy plateau. The ice palace glistened like a star, no more than a stone's throw away. Unfortunately a broken ice bridge prevented anyone from getting closer, except for any ninjas that could easily jump the gap. Having not visited the palace in about a year, Elsa had expected there to be some damage that needed to be repaired. However, she hadn't expected for there to be no way across to the palace, so she decided to take the opportunity to improve the overall design of the bridge. Since there would be someone living in her castle of isolation, it would be a good idea to strengthen everything. Setting to work, the Queen of Arendelle began working, and took her eyes off Naruto. As the first blasts of ice left her fingers a blinding cloud of snow exploded upwards, leaving her and the rest of the group covered in the white powder. When their vision cleared, Naruto was waving at them from the other side of the crevasse, yelling that he was going to take a look around. Once Elsa had given him the go-ahead, Naruto began examining the palace, and it was magnificent. The entire building shone brilliantly in the sun, with deep blues and cold whites complementing each other as hard edges and sharp lines enveloped the crystalline structure, only heightened by the wind that blew over the chilled exterior. Climbing the stairs and reaching the door, Naruto pushed against the frozen surface to open the building. The first room was massive as grand pillars and a winding staircase reached to the ceiling where a gorgeous ice chandelier was hanging precariously. The icy stem of the piece had been worn down over time, causing it to have dropped several large frozen chunks onto the floor. Deciding that it would be best for Elsa to attempt any repairs on the large fixture, Naruto thought it would be best for him to, at the least, move some of the large bits that had fallen down, making his way to the center of the room, dodging the occasional mound of snow as he walked. He noticed the west-facing window was open, most likely where all the snow had come from as well as the light that had caused so much damage. Having reached the center the shinobi stopped for a second and noticed a large snowman standing in one corner. The massive creation stood on two legs with strong arms and smoothed icicles for fingers, evidently something Elsa had created, given the intricate details of the statue. Wanting to get a closer look he quickly started gathering up the fallen pieces of the chandelier. Once he had the first set of crystals in hand, a sudden set of thuds caught the blonde by surprise before a massive white blocked his vision and he was sent flying into one of the far walls. When he regained his senses he found that the snowman, who had been standing still as a statue, had come to life and knocked him back. The orange wearer's imprint clearly visible on the giant's arm. Thief, get out, the apparently talkative snow giant yelled as it once again began charging forward. 
Naruto ducked under a strike aimed at him, sliding under the massive punch and retaliated, delivering his own punch to the creature's unprotected side, only to find his fist sink into hardened snow. Unable to pull his arm free in time, the blonde was, again, sent flying across the room. Regaining his footing quickly, Naruto curiously watched as the snowman checked on its new wound, but left it alone in favor of continuing the fight. Jumping backwards to distance himself from the brute, the blonde was hoping to get a few seconds to think of a plan since his attacks didn't seem to be working. Unfortunately for him the monster let out a fierce call as jagged shards of ice erupted from its body, coating itself in sharp spikes and changing its rounded frozen fingers into menacing claws. Now, very happy that he had backed up while he could, Naruto began trying to think of a plan for when the giant attacked again. While under Elsa's care, the blonde shinobi did not have the time to restock any of his weapons. Having used most of his supplies during the fight with Kaguya, and having woken up in the castle without the rest, Naruto didn't have many options for fending off the creature. In fact, the only thing he had that could be counted as a weapon was the plate from Uruka's old headband, and he really didn't want to use that against the now spiky snowman. This of course only left him with his favorite tools, his fist, his jutsus, and his ability to make up a plan as he went just the way he liked it, and with his need to use up some of his chakra. A fight seemed like the perfect way to do just that. It was only a second more before Naruto and the snowmen were running at each other, both intent on ending the fight as quickly as possible. Near the center of the room the two reached each other. The snow golem raised its arm, intent on smashing the blonde into the frozen floors. However the ninja had already planned out how he was going to take down his opponent. Confuse and swarm it. The monster halted its attack as Naruto erupted into a cloud of smoke that quickly spread through the entrance hall. Before the covering veil could dissipate several copies of the blonde came rushing out, each with a fist poised to strike. The first wave of clones rushed past the snowman, drawing its attention with quick jabs, each punch leaving a dent in its snowy body as they ran past. Once the first set of duplicates were behind it the second group came out of the smoke to continue distracting the golem while the original group kept around its back. With the second wave of the assault started, the first group made their move. Clones started jumping onto the creature's back, using the spike of ice to hold on as the beat into its large body. However, the monster proved more flexible than Naruto had anticipated, easily rotating its arm to grab a clone off its back before slamming the kopai into the ground. Yet for every duplicate that was crushed, swatted, or skewered another moved in to continue the attack. Soon the golem became annoyed with being swarmed by the same man, and began to switch up its tactics. With its swing of its arm to get the clones to back away, the giant let out a bellowing roar that ripped through the room and past the walls of the palace. As the sound faded, the piles of snow that littered the ground began to move around. It was slow at first, barely even noticeable to the point that Naruto ignored them completely, instead choosing to focusing on his fight with the Frosty Colossus, a decision he would soon regret. The first sign of trouble came when some of the clones that had stayed near the back began popping as mounds of white crashed down on top of them. Soon the horde of blondes were on the receiving end of their opponent's own swarming technique, as the moving hills of snow continued attacking, leaving room for the giant snowman to resume its own assault. The clones were being put on the defensive as they struggled to ward off the shifting snow piles, which broke apart and rejoined at will. It was only when one of the clones got a lucky punch in that the group realized what they were fighting. Clinging to the Kopai's arm were snowmen, little tiny snowmen, who gazed up at him with large black eyes, each one smiling joyfully as if they had been playing the most wonderful game. The revelation that the clones were being pushed around by smaller versions of the giant snowmen spurred the blondes into fighting harder, none of them wanting to admit that they were being matched in their typical swarm tactic. With new resolve the ninja doppelgangers brought their hands together and began channeling chakra, intent on putting an end to this fight. However before they could begin creating their classic spherical attack the fight was interrupted. Hi, Marshmallow, a loud voice yelled out, drawing everyone's attention to the top of the stairs where Olaf the snowman now stood waving. I heard your call and came as fast as I could. The animated lover of warm hugs gave a few meager jumps as he attempted to mount the handrail, possibly to try and ride it down, but soon gave up and slid down the stairs on his back. At the bottom of the steps he was greeted by the numerous tiny snowmen who had been harassing the shinobi and his copies moments before. The miniature creatures seemingly having lost interest in the fight once a new distraction had shown up, almost like they were children. Hello there Frost, and Flake, and Ansel, and Pat, and... The magic snowman slowed to a stop in his greeting of his smaller kin as he noticed the Naruto's frozen mid-fight against the giant snow golem. 
Marshmallow, you're making friends with the nice guy who talks funny and is hot like a whole summer's worth of hugs. Olaf continued. And look there are so many more of him now so there are even more hugs to go around. All of the blondes, who were very confused by this point, began looking at each other trying to make sense of what was going on. None of them really sure if they should continue fighting, or if it would be best to abandon the battle. Thankfully the people who could restore order arrived, as Anna, Kristoff, and Elsa burst into the palace. What's going on? The red-haired princess questioned as she barged through the heavy ice doors, looking concerned. We heard a roar, Kristoff continued as he chased after his girlfriend. Elsa, despite being last inside, was ready for anything as tiny flakes of ice circled her hands. She had feared that she might find her guest mid-combat with her most powerful creation. What she did not expecting to see were multiple copies of her friends scattered throughout the room. Naruto, why are there so many of you? Elsa asked feeling very unsure about what she had seen. The blonde was quiet for a few seconds trying to think of the words that might explain chakra to the three. Thankfully earlier that day Pabby had taught him the word for chakra. Magic, he proclaimed happily, content that despite his limited vocabulary he had adequately explained his clones. Magic, he says, Kristoff complained as the last light of the day faded. The mountain man steering his sled into Arendelle, as if that's all he needed to say to explain why there were ten of him. Kristoff, Elsa can make snow and ice appear with magic, Anna reminded her boyfriend. I don't think it's too hard to believe that Naruto can copy himself with magic. It would be more likely that he was unable to actually explain how he did it, in our language. But it's nice that he still tried, Elsa said from the back seat. Honestly right now I'm more worried about leaving Naruto alone with Marshmallow and the Snowjis overnight. It'll be fine, Anna replied, feeling confident that nothing bad would happen. Everyone was ready to be friends once we explained what was going on, and you saw them all working together to clean up when we left. We still should have remembered to warn Naruto about Marshmallow, or at least told him not to enter the palace alone. Elsa continued as she leaned back. With Naruto no longer sharing a seat with her, the queen had plenty of room to herself in the sled. She pulled her cloak tighter around herself to ward off a sudden gust of cold as the sled was pulled onto the cobble roads of Arendelle. I'm going back up to see him first thing in the morning, so none of us have to worry, Kristoff claimed. They're both tough enough to spend at least one night with each other. Besides Marshmallow only attacked because he thought Naruto was a thief, who was going to steal from the palace. I know, Elsa said, frustrated that she had to come back to the castle before night completely fell. If it had been possible she would have spent at least the first night in the palace to make sure Naruto settled in. But she had obligations as queen. Her only comfort was the knowledge that Naruto could take care of himself and wouldn't do anything that might hurt any of the snowmen. That still didn't make her feel comfortable about leaving her fellow blonde alone. Unfortunately she was going to be one of many worried people tonight. As the castle gates were drawing closer she spied a group of children waiting at the bridge. Most prominent of all, sat on the cold road at the front of the crowd, was little Ingrid. Elsa felt her heart sink as the sleigh pulled past the gathering and into the castle courtyard. The horrified faces the children made as they realized that Naruto wasn't with them, tore at the queen's feelings. As soon as Sven had stopped moving, and by the time several stable hands began helping put the sled away for the night, Elsa was already back out the gates and moving towards the kids. Ingrid, the ever-forward girl that she was, now stood halfway down the bridge waiting patiently. Yet her patience could only last for so long. Where is he? The young girl questioned as tears threatened to fall from her eyes. Elsa felt as if the weight of the world was on her as she sank down, kneeling in front of the girl. The queen felt her own lip quiver as she contemplated how best to explain to the girl where her hero was, all the while enduring the large curious stares of the village's children. He is staying in the mountains for a little bit, the royal blonde started. With how high his fever is, he's going to stay with some friends until he's fully healed. She cringed at the basic answer to the child's question, feeling bad that she was leaving out some of the important details. Yet Elsa felt that she shouldn't tell them about the trolls, for fear that they might go looking for them. And Naruto's earlier fight was a grim reminder of how dangerous Marshmallow could be. Part of Elsa wondered if the roles had been reversed if Naruto would have told the children fantastical stories about trolls and living snowmen never bothering with keeping anything from the young ones, but instead ensuring their safety on his own like a loving father. Sometimes it was hard to be the queen and think of the safety of all her subjects. No matter how small they were, is the going to come back? The soft words of Igrid broke the queen from her inner thoughts. Still kneeling Elsa raised her hand and smiled as she wiped away the young girl's tears. I don't think there's anything that could keep him away for too long. You know how strong he is, Elsa said, feeling her chest lighten with each word. 
and when he's all healed and comes back, I'll bet he's going to give you a great big hug. Elsa felt content at the smiling faces of all the children, and a couple of the adults that had joined the crowd also curious about the ninja's whereabouts. There was only one last question from Ingrid, and Elsa didn't know how to answer it. Do you think he will he give me a shoulder ride, like some of the other girls' papas do? Arendel Castle was quiet and cold, the winter night blanketing everything in darkness, yet some residents found it difficult to sleep. Chief among these individuals was Elsa, who found herself restlessly sat on the side of her bed. The pale moonlight shining down on her form, having given up on trying to fall asleep. Placing her naked feet on the cold floor she stood up and began stretching her lieth body in the hopes of relieve some tension. Finding no relief for her stiff muscles from the almost day-long sled riding, the queen thought about asking Naruto, in the morning, if he could help ease some of the strain with his heat and a massage. Only for her to stop and sigh as she remembered that Naruto wasn't in the castle, and with any luck his body heat would be lowered significantly when he did return meaning that after a hard day of being queen she wouldn't be able to enjoy any more hot back rubs. Giving up on her train of thought, for now at least, the young woman strode over to the window of her bedroom, drawing the curtain farther back to let the moonlight glisten on her skin, casting her silhouette against the far wall. She felt breeze through the glass, sending a soft shudder down her frame. Perhaps the window had lost its seal, causing a chill in the room, which was why she was unable to sleep. The staff would have to be told in the morning, but for the time being Elsa felt she could go for a walk around the castle, possibly finding herself a vacant room. Pulling on a dressing gown she opened the door and walked into the hallway, the soft carpet keeping her still bare feet warm. While the castle was dark the queen guided herself by memories, long past moments of her youth running up and down the corridors with Anna as the two of them explored their home. Part way down a hall, past Anna's room, Elsa felt another chill as she walked by a door the open window inside the room being the most likely culprit for the draft. Although why it hadn't been closed for the winter left her confused. However the answer came to her when she entered, and realized that it was her old room where Naruto had stayed. The staff had probably forgotten to close the window that was left open to help cool down their blonde guest. Thus she found herself sealing up the room to increase the temperature a bit even going so far as to light a small fire in the seldom-used fireplace. A few short hours ago such an act would have defeated the purpose of trying to cool Naruto down, but now brought a warmth to the stone castle. Not wanting to leave the fire unattended, Elsa took a seat behind her desk. She considered moving the heavy piece of furniture out of the room, now that she no longer needed to keep an eye on her fellow blonde, but found herself hesitate as she looked to the empty ice bed. Perhaps she could discuss it with Naruto when he returned. This was more his room than her makeshift office after all. With her decision made, she sunk into her high back chair as she closed her eyes in comfort. While sleep still eluded her, there was a comforting presence about the room that helped ease her mind. After some time had passed she reopened her eyes, a feeling of refreshment washing over her. Finding herself still sat at her desk, but with no desire to get any work done, she passed the time by once again reading through the Japanese dictionary that she had bought several months ago. Having read it cover to cover several times she still put forth time to try and memorize more of the foreign words. As the night dragged on she continued to flip through the pages for any word that might happen to catch her interest. Unfortunately nothing caught her eye, and she gave up on reading for the moment. Once again reminded that the book was meant to help merchants speak with each other, not translate the whole language. The fact that she was unable to find the word for magic proved that fact nicely. A sudden crack startled the queen out of her thoughts as the fires she had been watching started to die. The dancing flames growing smaller, before receding into embers with a final pop. With the once cold room returned to a decent temperature, Elsa closed her book and stood up. Trying to stifle a yawn, she looked towards the ice bed and not wanting to walk more than she had to, considered staying in the room for the night. A thought that was quickly discarded, as the staff would worry in the morning if they couldn't find her in her usual bed. Plus she had left her room to avoid the cold, not sleep on it. Walk around her desk she made sure the fire was completely gone, before she left. As she was leaving, she sent a blast of frost to the bed, purely on instinct, to make sure it stayed frozen. Not even realizing what she had done she closed the door behind her. With nothing left to distract her, Elsa returned to her room. A familiar chill greeted her as she approached her bed. Pulling off her robe and carelessly tossing it onto a nearby chair, she slipped between the covers and fell asleep almost instantly. Yet one final thought entered her mind before she began to dream. She missed Naruto. Anna was dancing through the castle halls as she looked around for her sister, 
who was currently missing lunch. The throne was empty and she hadn't been in her own bedroom. So, logically, she must be in Naruto's bedroom, which just so happened to serve as the queen's office. Landing in front of the partially open door with a flourish, Anna knocked and entered. Hey Elsa, the cheerful girl sang out. Good morning Anna, the queen replied tiredly, her eyes giving away her lack of sleep the night before. Actually it's afternoon, and your lunch is getting cold, the redhead corrected her sister. The queen immediately turned to look out the window at the bright snowy day. The sun slightly passed its highest point, and already beginning the slow journey downward. I didn't realize it was so late, she said. It's fine, the princess replied with a sweet smile as she followed her sister's gaze. You look tired, she pointed out, as she moved farther in. I had some trouble falling asleep last night, the blonde replied, softly rubbing her dreary eyes. It did seem extra chilly last night, Anna said, watching the snow-filled fields through the window as she rubbed her arms together for warmth. I heard a lot of the staff talking about how cold it was. The window was left open, in here, last night, Elsa stated. We'll have to ask the staff to check every room and make sure the castle is sealed tight. The red-headed princess gave a nod as she continued to watch the snow. She turned to her sister. A smile started to stretch across her lips as a wonderful idea came to her. Do you want to build a snowman? By the time the sisters made it back inside the castle the courtyard was littered with snowmen. And Elsa's lunch had gone cold, needing to be replaced with a simple meal from the kitchen. Although the staff were grateful that the queen had stopped by, given their current problem. Apparently all the chefs were so used to having Naruto around that the usual amount of ramen had been made. But there was now no one to eat at all. While Elsa was busy trying to think of the logistics of sending the noodle soup to Naruto via Kristoff's sled, Anna came up with a better idea. Invite all the orphans over and let them have the food. It would certainly make them smile. And since it was Anna's idea, Elsa felt that it should be her sister to go and tell all the energetic children that they would be dining in the castle that night. Just like they did while the new orphanage was being built. Until then Elsa was going to finish some paperwork before their guests arrive. So later that evening a horde of children were seen charging through the streets, a smiling princess running beside them the whole way. The large group only coming to a stop once they got over the castle's bridge, where a garden of snowmen silently waited for them. There are so many snowmen, the ever outgoing Ingrid yelled, seeming to skate between each creation. And every one of them loves warm hugs, an excited Anna cheered. Do all snowmen love warm hugs? The bright-eyed boy asked. Well, all the ones made by Elsa do, was the princess response. As children often do questions of how and why soon followed, leaving Anna lost for words. While she knew that Olaf liked warm hugs, she couldn't seem to remember where that fact came from. A creeping fear about her magically altered memories began to appear. The children's inquiry was interrupted by the arrival of the orphanage keepers. Many of the older caretakers, including the matron, had chosen to turn down dinner at the castle to have a quiet night by themselves. Thank you for guiding the children here Princess Anna, a young attendant casually said between labored breaths. The other chaperones, while equally as winded, smiled happily as the children danced among the snow sculptures. After nearly ten minutes everyone had been herded into the castle. It took so long that Elsa had finished her work and was waiting for everyone inside. Of course all the children and caretakers bowed as soon as they saw her. Even Igrid knelt down before the queen, but quickly jumped up and flashing a large toothy smile, which Elsa found eerily similar to an absent blonde. Although the little girl did relieve some of the loneliness that had been present all day, Anna stood near the back, having been the last person inside, watching with a smile as everyone tried to show as much respect to her sister as possible. Her smile dropped slightly as thoughts drifted towards a desire for them to show her the same respect, but she quickly banished the thoughts, content with the townspeople's smile over their bent forms, part of the perks of being the princess instead of the queen she guessed. Queen Elsa, Igrid said, calling attention to herself. Why do snowmen like warm hugs? Many of the children's heads popped up, each wanting to know the answer just as much, while the caretakers looked at each other in confusion, as none of them had been present for the initial question. Elsa, for her part, was just as confused, looking towards Anna in curiosity as to why they would ask her instead of the outgoing princess. Sorry, I don't remember it all, the redhead replied, curious if it had anything to do with her missing memories. Elsa was quiet for a few seconds before she started trying to stifle a giggle behind her own hand. Of course you wouldn't remember. You were only two years old when it happened, the queen stated with a large smile, retreating deeper into the entrance hall 
and making sure that everyone was following her to the warmer interior, Elsa took a seat on a lone couch beside a set of stairs. The children all gathered around her, eager to hear a story from the queen. Many years ago, Princess Anna and I went out into the snow to make a snowman. The icy beauty started softly, a happy smile at the children's large stairs. But no matter what we tried we couldn't keep the snow from falling over. So we went into the kitchen to find something to build up our snowman around. We found a long stick with a metal tip what would be perfect to stick in the ground. All the onlookers were silent, enraptured by the story. Elsa, wanting to add a bit more whimsy to the tale, held out her hand and pinching the air just above her palm pulled up, creating a small snowman in her hand which all the children crowded around to see. Unfortunately we had taken the coal shovel for the stove, and the kitchen staff couldn't work with how cold it was. Our mother had to come out and try to convince us that we needed to take down the snowman, so the shovel could be returned. Of course little Anna refused to destroy our creation. The elder sister stated with a sly smirk at her sibling. You said I was too, the redhead counter, embarrassed by the comment. Although the more the story progressed the more relieved she felt that this memory had not been changed with magic, but instead had been forgotten in the same old non-magical way most memories are lost. With the princess interruption, Elsa took some time to create more of a snowy scene in her palm, adding the two young sisters and their mother around the snowman. A sudden shifting on the couch made the queen realize that Ingrid had taken up a seat next to her, staring at the handheld winter wonderland intently with everyone else. Elsa could only smile at the outgoing girl. Our mother told us that we had to separate the shovel from our snowman, because the snow would want to stay outside in the cold, but the shovel would want to go inside where it was warm. So Anna said that she would come outside every day to give the snowman a warm hug to keep the shovel happy while the snow stayed outside. In the end the snowman was left up, and we had to go into town to buy a new coal shovel for the kitchen. So every morning Anna would race outside to give the snowman a great warm hug. Elsa took a break for a few seconds while she looked at the children all smiling at the tail. And those hugs were so great and warm that the snowman told all the other snowmen about how good warm hugs were, and that is why snowmen like warm hugs. The children all stood and cheered dancing around at the story and pleading with the caretakers to take them back outside so they too could hug the snowman in the courtyard. Thankfully before any of them could try and head into the cold, the doors swung open and a snow-covered Kristoff and Sven walked in, quickly getting inside where it was warm. Anna raced over to her boyfriend, and headless of his frozen clothes gave him one of her, now famous, warm hugs, something the ice harvester accepted with gratitude. Sven just wandered off to find a nice fireplace. What's with all the kids? Kristoff asked, having moved closer to the group. The kitchen made Naruto-sized portions by mistake, and we thought the orphans would like to come back for a nice meal. Anna replied, stationed next to her boyfriend. Speaking of, I've got a report on our favorite blonde, the gruff man said, until he looked towards Elsa. Second favorite, he amended, not wanting to insult the queen before taking off his cap and looking up at his own hair, third favorite. You can tell us over dinner, Elsa said with a chuckle, looking over the children still gathered around her. I think it's time for everyone to go wash up before we eat. Although many of the children groaned and huffed, all of them hurried off to get ready for dinner. Ingrid and Elsa sharded a large smile before the young girl followed after her friends, while Anna and Kristoff joined the caretakers in herding the children towards the nearest washrooms, leaving Elsa alone. The queen's palm was still filled with the miniature snowy scene. A quick thought was all it took for everything to change, as a replica of the ice palace rose up, with two figures standing in front of the structure, one a man and the other a woman, their fists touching, the same as hers and Naruto's had yesterday when they said goodnight, as had become their secret tradition over the past few months. Dismissing the scene from her hand, Elsa stood and walked towards the kitchen, eager to hear how her friend was faring on the mountain. Hopefully he had cooled down a little. The morning sun glistened off the snow from the highest peak of the northern mountain. Elsa's ice palace sparkled as the rays passed through the open windows and onto the face marshmallow, the snow giant slowly moving from where it had laid down to rest the night before. It only took a few minutes for the creature to stand and begin to move around the palace, checking every room to make sure that everything its mistress had made was intact and in place, which, of course, everything was just as it had been last night. The palace's guardian did this every morning and evening having little else to do on top of the mountain besides keep everything tidy, at least until the snowjis showed up and turned each day into an unscripted parade. Of course Olaf's frequent visits were also unpredictable. The fact that one of those visits happened to be when he brought the snowjis to the mountain peak was not lost on the golem, a fact that never failed to make Marshmallow smile. 
having immediately become attached to all of its siblings. The one thing that was different about the palace was last night's new addition, Naruto, who had spent his time exploring the palace before going to bed. The long journey to the mountaintop must have tired him out given how quickly he fell asleep, yet found the energy to disappear before the giant woke up. The soft colossus looked around a few side rooms of the palace, but had little luck in finding the new addition. Only when it opened the doors leading outside was it evident where the guest had gone. Given the army of clones that now roamed around the snowy expanse before the palace, the giant snow creature nodded its head, happy to have found the blonde its mistress was interested in. The numerous copies of the blonde did worry the golem for a bit, but remembering their fight from the previous evening, Marshmallow wasn't too worried by the sudden increase of guests, figuring they would be gone just as abruptly as they appeared. Naruto had been hard at work since before the sun had come up. After having stuck to basic physical conditioning for the past six months, he was ready to get back to serious training. While he had been holding off from training in the hope that his chakra would heal his overheating problem, it was really boring. While Elsa had, thankfully, been there to keep him company, he still found himself wanting to go out and do something. However, his caretakers were adamant that he needed to rest, enabling him in his belief that he shouldn't be using too much of his chakra. Hopefully that stone troll guy would be correct, and he would start healing once he began using chakra again. The sooner he started feeling better, the sooner he could get back to the castle. Even though it had just been a single night, he missed seeing Elsa every morning, and he had promised to play more games with Ingrid and the other children. So before the sun even came up the blonde was already outside, warmed up, and ready to start wasting chakra. With his desires solidified the blonde started training as soon as he woke up. He started by summoning several groups of shadow clones once he was outside, not wanting to cause any damage by getting started inside the ice palace. Having created the clones more to waste chakra than for any real reason, Naruto let each of them do as they pleased, with some of them starting to spar against each other, while others immediately began channeling chakra, enjoying the familiar warmth of their internal energy. And that was how most of the morning went, as copies of the blonde kept practicing, with the original joining a group in their activity before moving on to join another. Eventually the sun was high enough to start the morning in earnest, and the doors to the ice palace swung open, letting out Marshmallow, who stayed by the doors before beckoning the shinobi inside. With the sudden appearance of the snow golem, Naruto's stomach took that moment to release a loud growl, a reminder that he couldn't live on training alone and need breakfast, something he was eager to get to. He was curious about what kind of food the trolls had packed for him. Taking the stairs, two at a time, the blonde rushed back towards the grand doors of the ice palace, only to forcefully come to a stop when Marshmallow barred his entrance, the snow golem looking pointedly at the delicate steps of ice that now had a footprint melted into every other one. Naruto, having taken off his shoes before he began training, as well as his shirt and jacket, had forgotten to grab his clothes from the base of the stairs, a fact that left him with a deep blush on his face as he rocketed back to the pile of clothes in a single jump. Landing and dressing quickly, Naruto returned to the top of the stairs, self-conscious of the indents his excessive body heat had made on his previous ascent, and hoping that Elsa was forgiving when she inevitably found out what he had done to her pristine ice sculpture. Although with how kind and fair she was, he didn't think he would be given to harsh of a punishment. Breakfast was a less chaotic event than the blonde had expected. Having met the residents of the palace, and knowing how many there were, he had expected things to be an out-of-control mess with the snowjis constantly running around. While the tiny snow creatures were running through the entire palace, causing trouble, they mostly kept to their routines and left the blonde alone, at least until he was finished eating. By that point the snowjis couldn't stay away from him, and trailed behind as he began to explore the icy mansion. At first, Naruto found it unsettling to be followed around by a tidal wave of snow, but eventually he grew accustomed to the company. Though he did try to be friendly with the braver ones that would walk beside him, he made the effort to keep some distance so he wouldn't cause any of them to melt. This continued on as he walked around his new home for the foreseeable future, trying to get acquainted with the magnificent palace and admiring the beauty of it, awestruck by just how beautiful it was, perfectly matching the queen who built it. Eventually he grew restless from walking around the palace and made his way back outside, where he continued to expel as much chakra as he could, which was a lot. By the time the sun had reached its peak, the blonde and his clones had cleared out a large portion of land in front of the palace's stairs, leaving a stone patio on top of the mountain. It was during a spar with a clone, while Naruto was created a racing gun, that the displaced ninja heard another growl. 
thinking himself to be hungry again. He sat down, ate something, and got back to training, only to hear another rumble. Realizing that it wasn't his stomach, and getting worried, he began to look around. While he didn't know a lot about mountains, he had been on enough missions to know what bad things could happen on one. Mainly, an avalanche, with an army of clones searching the entire mountain top. It wasn't long before Naruto found out what was wrong. Nothing. No matter where he searched there was nothing that looked like it might have caused the loud noises. There were no snowy overhangs that might fall down any second. He couldn't find any fissures that were about to swallow everything up. In fact the worst he did find were two trees that had fallen over from the weight of their snow-coated branches. Yet the sounds continued to grow louder and more frequent the longer he searched, which caused him to grow more concerned, leading him to summon more clones to search even more of the mountain. And still the sounds continued to grow louder and longer as he searched. With nothing to go on but a sound and some growing paranoia, Naruto returned to the front of the palace, or he decided to do something that his many teachers had been trying to get him to do for years. He sat down and tried to think about what to do. Maybe all that time he spent with Elsa was doing him some good. For almost half an hour, Naruto sat on the ground, unable to think of anything that might help him. Instead he ended up spending most of the time resting from his earlier search, regaining a bit of the chakra he had exhausted. As his break continued, Naruto noted that the once loud rumblings had quieted down, where once they had occurred at erratic intervals. Now the growling was low and constant, almost rhythmic in nature, like someone's breathing was evening out just before they woke up. Suddenly one last roar was heard, louder than any of the others so far. It had startled Naruto so much that before he even knew what happened, he was standing. The following silence unnerved the blonde. Cautious of how quiet it was, it was so quiet in fact, that there was nothing to block the sleepy sound that brought a smile to the ninja's face. Kid, while Kristoff was accustomed to long rides in his sled, he wasn't used to consecutive rides over the course of a day. First he had to go to the ice fields, then back to the castle, and here he was finishing the last bit of his journey to the ice palace, where Naruto was staying, and he still had to make it back down the mountain. It had already been an exhausting day so far, yet there was still so much to do. Rounding the last corner to reach the mountain top, the gruff man kept his eyes to what passed for a road, fully focusing on parking the sled. When he finally looked up at the full scale of the icy palace he took some time to marvel at the wonder. Each tower stood tall and proud in the late afternoon sun, with the pure ice spires magnifying the cloud-painted sky behind them, casting rainbows of light across the frozen landscape causing the shadows to leap around in a dance of erratic joy. To the ice harvester it was just as perfect a sight as the first time he had seen the palace, a perfect monument to the material he loved so much that never failed to captivate him. Even now, keeping him within a trance until his reindeer partner bumped into him with a concerned snort. Looking towards Sven, with a bit of annoyance, Kristoff tried to find out why he had just been broken from his awe-induced stupor. Yet the reindeer only stared forward in a similar fashion to the ice harvester. Following the large animal's gaze, Kristoff finally saw where his fellow blonde was. Sitting on the ground, motionless to the point that several birds had settled within his hair, was Naruto. The unnatural heat from his body being the only thing that kept him from being buried in the falling snow and a small, almost eerily absent, movement of his chest was the only sign that the blonde was still alive. Kristoff immediately began running towards the seemingly dead man, a strike of panic coursing through his body. Naruto's smile was wide and bright, a stark contrast to the murky surroundings of his own mindscape. Hirama's normally fierce expression was replaced with half-closed eyes as the fox's head rested on the ground. Its slow rhythmic breathing gave away just how tired the giant beast was. Having only just woken up from a long slumber. I'm glad you're awake, Naruto practically yelled out. I'm glad to be awake too, Kirama replied, trying to keep a superior tone despite being exhausted. And I guess, I'm glad you're not dead. Naruto chuckled in return. While he had only befriended the Biju for a short time during the war, he could tell that the Biju was just acting disinterested. Nearly falling back into old habits, with a large smile the blonde held up his hand towards the fox, and with no bars between them, Kirama easily pushed its own fist against Naruto's own. A loud laugh was shared between the two as they rejoiced at their reunion. How long have I been asleep? The Biju asked once both of them had fallen silent. About half a year, the blonde guesses out loud, not having paid attention to the passage of time while he had been in Arendelle, mostly due to him being stuck in the castle for fear of hurting anyone. Why did it take you so long to wake me up? Kirama growled out in shock. Once you used enough chakra, so your body wasn't cooking itself, I should have woken up soon after. I wasn't really sure what was wrong with me when I woke up, so I decided not to use too much chakra until I healed. 
Naruto replied, scratching at the back of his head. Before I got knocked out, I told you that your body was using too much chakra, and we needed to get rid of as much of it as possible for you to survive. A loud yawn followed the Biju's growled statement. Oh, I don't really remember a lot after the battle, except for saying goodbye to everyone. A large grin spread across the blonde's face as he thought about his friends, happy in the knowledge that they were safe. Everything else is a bit hazy. Too tired to assault the boy for his stupidity, Kurama settled for shaking its large head in disbelief. Although the fox did take a second to sense the low temperature outside the blonde's mind. At least our luck held out and you landed somewhere cold enough that all the extra chakra was used up just keeping you warm. Well, I only came to this mountain yesterday, but I'm told the trolls found me in the forest outside Arendelle. Thankfully Elsa was able to keep me cool and save my life. The blonde began to scratch at the back of his head at the thought of his friend. What are trolls, where is Arnadel, and who in the hell is Elsa? The beast questioned, confusion and intrigue holding off tiredness. Naruto spent the next hour recounting his adventures in the new world he had landed in, trying his best to describe all the important events that he had been a part of. Although every few minutes the blonde had to stop and let his vulpine partner release another earth-shaking yawn to stave off sleep. The duo did share a few laugh at some of Naruto's more idiotic moments, specifically about him jumping into a burning building. It was really annoying trying to learn a new language. Naruto rambled on as he reached the end of his tale. At least Elsa and I can talk to each other now, so I guess it was worth it. Obviously, you respect this woman quite a lot if you're putting that much effort into learning how to talk with her. Krumer replied with a hidden smirk. Well yeah, she's super nice and I owe her so much. Plus she's my friend. I'm sure, the fox said, now extremely curious about the relationship between its container and this queen. Suddenly the biju stopped moving, sensing the world outside the seal. It seems someone else wants to talk to you. Go see what they want, while I go back to sleep and rest up, so I can yell at you for being stupid later. Any retort that Naruto might have had was wasted as the fox fell into a comfortable sleep, fully incapable of hearing anything the blonde might say. With nothing keeping him there, Naruto returned to the waking world. Waiting for the shinobi was Kristoff. A look of pure terror in the gruff man's eyes as he looked over his fellow Naruto opened his own eyes the ice harvester jumped back in shock, before sighing deeply as he massaged his weary face. Oh, thank all that is good and has antlers, the mountain man spoke in an exasperated voice. You were so still I thought you froze to death, and then when I got back to the castle Elsa was going to freeze me. The words were spoken too fast for Naruto to fully comprehend what his friend was saying. But it was clear that something had him upset. It was rather obvious given how frantically the ice harvester switched between rambling incoherently and trying to take calming breaths. This continued on for almost a minute before Sven walked up and physically bumped into the blonde to stop him. Before anything else could upset the mentally tired man, Naruto decided to bring him into the ice palace, where they could take their time going over anything that needed to be reported to Elsa, which kept the man calm for the few seconds it took to reach the steps, where the obvious footprints melted into the once pristine ice sent him into a round of questions. It took over an hour for Kristoff to check everything he needed to before heading home, making sure that Naruto would have enough food and blankets to survive until his next visit. With his mind full of facts to tell Anna and Elsa, the extremely tired ice harvester loaded into his sled and waved his goodbyes as he and Sven started down the mountain. However, once Kristoff was back at the castle he was greeted with the entire Arendelle orphanage seated for dinner. While it was a very enjoyable meal of warm noodles and broth, it was a bit distracting. Finally, once everyone was full, he settled down to tell the royal sisters, plus one particular little girl, about the ninja's health. Outside of being tired from playing in the snow all day, I'm happy to say that he's just as active as ever. The ice harvester said to the bright smiles of all. While I was there he and Marshmallow spent their time trying to corral all the snowjis. So those two are getting along well. He did choose to leave out the part about him thinking that Naruto had died. There was no reason to make anyone worry about something that even he didn't understand. When he had pressed Naruto about why he had been sitting so still, the shinobi was unable to properly explain what he had been doing. The only thing Kritsov had been able to understand was that his fellow blonde had been talking to a friend, however that was possible on the mountaintop. He should have enough food and supplies to last him a full week up there, but I plan to go back up again the day after tomorrow. He said, much to his own delight as his girlfriend wrapped herself around him in thanks for being such a great guy. 
The rest of the evening was spent herding the children back to the orphanage, before everyone turned in themselves. Although Kristoff couldn't shake the feeling that he had forgotten to mention something to Elsa. Back on top of the mountain Naruto looked out the window at the damaged ice steps, hoping that Kristoff had remembered to tell Elsa about them. Happy birthday Elsa, everyone yelled out as the queen stood behind a table with a massive chocolate cake. A large room in the castle was filled with a small group of people, most of them being staff members. While normally the birthday of a beloved ruler would be cause for mass celebration, Elsa had grown up preferring smaller, more intimate parties. This worked out for the best, since the Joel Festival was only a few days away during which the villagers were more than happy to give their best wishes. After the attendees had finished passing out slices of cake, the blonde queen took the time to look around at everyone. Her sister was darting around the room, making sure to talk with each guest at least once. Some of the staff had taken to tidying up, so they would have less to do later, while Olaf seemed to be everywhere at once. The final guest, a blonde man, stood off in a corner and upon noticing her gaze, gave a light wave before going back to talking with his reindeer friend. Elsa let out a soft breath, happy to be surrounded by those she knew so well, but feeling like there was someone missing. A sudden gust of wintry air made very clear who wasn't there. The sun-like warmth of the absent man was missed by all who frequented the castle. Happy birthday, Anna called next to her sister, having finished her rounds. And happy half-birthday to you, Elsa returned with a half-smile. Oh yeah, I keep forgetting about that, the redhead said. But I'm happy where my birthday is. Not only is it opposite to yours, but I also get two sets of presents each year. Here the princess stopped and looked at the scant amount of wrapped gifts on a far table. While it's just easier to give you all your presents at Christmas, given how close your birthday is. It's not so bad to have a birthday so close to the holidays, Elsa said, her mind wandering to years past. As fond memories of her parents giving her a new toy during Anna's birthday. To keep things even brought a smile to her lips. While more gifts would be nice, I don't think a queen should complain too much. True, Anna agreed, unable to counter the claim. But depending on when you get married you could get anniversary present in the summer, the red-haired princess almost sang out. A deep flush stained Elsa's cheeks as she resisted the urge to cover her face, her sister having brought up one of the most embarrassing topics she had to deal with. Please Anna, not you too. I already have enough people asking me about when I'll get married. Elsa resisted the urge to hold her head, just feeling happy that winter was here again, and she wouldn't have to deal with any foreign dignitaries asking about her love life. Although the topic of marriage did have one bright spot, the ability to tease her sister. Of course I don't think you have any room to talk about marriage. The queen purposely turned her attention towards the blonde ice harvester on the other side of the room. Yeah, Anna coughed out, a flush matching her hair upon her cheeks. Some of the villagers have been way to forward in their inquiries. The princess was quiet again, looking anywhere but her boyfriend. Elsa stifled a chuckle at her sister's discomfort, before changing the topic to help ease the tension. Speaking of the villagers, how's our little surprise coming along? The sisters waited a second, casually noted that Olaf wasn't near them, and began speaking in hushed whispers about their upcoming plans. While most of the food will need to be prepared on the day of the feast, the chefs have already started making what they can, Anna said, recounting as what the staff had told her. And with the banquet being right after we ring the Joel bell, everyone will be there, Elsa cheered, genuinely excited to give the people a gift of her own for the holidays. Anna's voice cut through her sister's giddiness, everyone, except for one will be there. The queen deflated slightly, knowing full well who would be missing the party. As much as I want Naruto to be in attendance, I have to keep in mind the safety of everyone else. The blonde's shoulders sagged as she continued, not happy with the decision she had to make. With the entire village in one place, the chance that someone might bump into Naruto and burn themselves is too great a risk to take. While that's easy to fix, Anna stated, we'll just have him stand a little farther back from the main group. You know how much he loves to sit in the rafters of the castle. And what would be the point of bringing him to a party if we don't let him join the party? Elsa asked, having already spent hours working through the problem in her head. It would be best to have him come down for the New Year celebration. Everyone should be a bit more spread out, and he can more easily avoid bumping into anyone. Anna listened, not having a good argument against her sister's idea, although she was not pleased with the idea of spending the holidays without even one of her friends, especially since this would be the first holiday she spent with Elsa without a door between them. Not to mention that Kristoff, Sven, and Olaf would also be there, but the princess wanted to make sure that everyone had a great time. And knowing Elsa as well as she did, Anna was certain that her sister would be constantly worried about the blonde-haired man living in the mountains, 
and the queen would just continue to worry until he returned to Arendelle. Thankfully, Anna had her own blonde man who could easily make it up the mountains. You want me to go to the ice palace and bring Naruto back as a present for Elsa? Kristoff asked, making sure he had heard everything correctly. Exactly, Anna cheered, having pulled Kristoff away from the party to discuss her new plan with him. You'll leave after we ring the Joel bell and be back with him in time for all the nighttime activities. And by that time, a lot of people will have already gone home, so there'll be less of a chance for him to accidentally hurt anyone. It'll be perfect and Elsa will love it. Resisting the urge to ask for clarification, on her choice of wording, Kristoff agreed with his girlfriend's plan and let her wander off. None the wiser that she had just, plainly, asked him to bring the queen a man, as a present, for nighttime activities. The mountain man loved the redhead, with all his heart, but sometimes it was obvious that she had been a little sheltered as a child. With a shrug of his shoulders, Kristoff went to make some early preparations for the Christmas tradition he celebrated with the trolls, and wished to spread to his girlfriend and her family. Since he was now going up a mountain instead of making the traditional Flemmy stew, he needed to go get ready for the surprise trip he now needed to make. While it wasn't a complete disaster, the surprise feast had not gone as Anna had planned. The Joel Bell ceremony went perfectly, with the whole town showing up to ring in the holiday season with a joyous sound. Unfortunately, immediately after she and Elsa had rung the Joel Bell, when their surprise feast was to be unveiled, everyone went home. Their own holiday traditions waiting for them in the warmth of their own homes, with their own families. Elsa had been crushed that their gift had been unneeded, and Anna could only think of one way to cheer her sister up. A few words later and Kristoff was on his way up the North Mountain to bring his fellow blonde home for the holidays, assuming that Naruto would be able to understand what was going on. So, you are having a winter festival, and you're going to give gifts to each other, Naruto recited, making sure he got everything that Kristoff had told him. That about covers it, the ice harvester said. And for some reason, Elsa is sad. Naruto asked, getting a nod in return. Let me make a gift and we can go. It took him only a few minutes, but Naruto exited the ice palace carrying a small package covered in paper. Kristoff didn't worry too much about it, knowing that his fellow blonde didn't have a lot of resources at the mountain top to make much of anything. Honestly all there was to work with was ice. The trip down the mountain went quickly, yet still took enough time for the sky to turn dark, leaving a beautifully lit Arendelle off in the distance. Or it would have been lovely if more than half the lights within the town were on, leaving the houses with a dark atmosphere, a heavy contrast for such a happy time of the year. It was only through Naruto's observant eyes and keen hearing that they noticed flickering lights and the sound of caroling through the forests. Making their way forward, the two men were surprised to find a celebration taking place in a clearing in the woods, with what looked like the whole town of Arendelle in attendance. Several tables made of ice had been created in the ankle-deep snow, topped to the point of spilling over with food and snacks for everyone to enjoy. Some of the townsfolk had taken to skating around on a nearby frozen pond. While those on land chatted with each other, ate delicious food, and held candles to help illuminate the large area. And off to the side, standing near the center of the clearing, was Elsa, surrounded by the people she worked tirelessly to take care of, all of them wishing her well, or thanking her for all that she has done over the past few months. With hopes of good things to come in the next year, suddenly, a silence began to pass through the crowds, starting near the edges before reaching the center, causing Anna and Elsa to bring their heads up and locked eyes with the two blonde men who had just stumbled into the clear. For several seconds, it was silent, the sudden appearance of the two men being a welcome, yet unexpected surprise. But once the silence had settled, the first ones to move were a set of girls. Ingrid, for as young as she was, began charging through the snow towards the blonde-haired man. The other girl was Anna, who leaned over to her sister and whispered a quick Merry Christmas Elsa, hope you like your present, before pushing the queen forwards. By this point the rest of the villagers had come out of their shock and began talking to each other. Meanwhile Ingrid had reached the shinobi, stopping just in front of him, keeping just far enough away that she wouldn't be burned by his heat. Although her smile was just as radiant as it always was, Narad also wore a smile, but it was more subdued, determined. While he knew what he was about to do was safe, he still worried for the little girl he had come to care for so greatly. With slow movements, he pulled the protective gloves from his hands and held his fist out for her to see. Normally the heat from his body would be enough to keep the snowfall from ever reaching his skin. Yet now, each icy flake had to fly next to him before melting, a sign that all his hard work to lower his fever had been successful. Ingrid, herself, couldn't have possibly been brighter, curling her own fingers into a fist and bumped it against Naruto's own. While warm, there was no danger of her being burned from the blonde's skin. 
It was only a few seconds before the little girl threw her arms around the ninja's waist, happy that her friend was feeling better. By the time Elsa reached the two, she couldn't keep the smile from her face. The little girl and the Yuzumaki continuing to embrace was a heartwarming sight. Although the hug did remind the queen of something else she had promised earlier, giving a sweet smile that couldn't hide her smirk, Elsa leaned down to Naruto and whispered softly in his ear. Ingrid had let go of the man by this point and joined the rest of the villagers in wondering what was being spoken. Between the two blondes, it was a short-held secret, known only by them for a passing second, before Naruto's broad smile turned mischievous. Reaching forward with singular purpose, the ninja grabbed hold of little Ingrid by her sides and lifted her into the air, screaming for only a moment as she found herself weightless while being turned around mid-air. The young child soon found herself sitting on her idol's shoulders while his firm hands held her safely to him. Elsa helped as well, placing a steadying hand on the girl's back, which mostly served to increase Ingrid's glee, leading to her shouts of joy lighting up the cold winter night. The whole town was talking now, with hushed whispers passing through the gathered crowds. Most of them were discussing Ingrid and how happy she looked, riding on Naruto's shoulders, while a few others were more focused on Elsa and how telling her actions might be. The queen would look so lovely wearing white. An older woman spoke softly to her group of friends. Oh Halima, you old romantic, someone chided her, remembering how in love the woman had been in her youth, before her beloved had disappeared. A few steps away, Kristoff had joined with Anna, holding her close with one arm as the couple watched on. Thanks for bringing Naruto to Elsa, the red-headed princess said, kissing her blonde on the cheek. It was super easy to see how worried she's been about him. With the last guests having finally arrived, the party continued long into the night. Naruto would walk around, greeting everyone, Ingrid still riding on his shoulders and Elsa by his side. Eventually the ninja ran into Olaf, and it had to be explained that the reason for the outdoor part was caused by the snowman. Apparently after the Joel ceremony, the carrot-nosed individual went out to collect as many traditions from the villagers as possible. Then, through a series of strange events, Olaf became lost and everything he had collected had been destroyed. It was crazy, the snowman said. First the tree that you're supposed to hang stuff on caught fire, and that spread to the brooms. Which let me tell you, I was given those brooms to hide from the witches, and I think I accomplished that goal. They're ash now, and no one is going to find them. Naruto listened, trying his best to keep up with the energetic snowman. Ingrid and Elsa smiled, familiar with the story already, but enjoying the more detailed telling. The tradition I think I'm most upset about losing was the sauna, Akaf continued, pointing at Naruto. I think you and Elsa would have really liked it. First you get naked, put on only a towel, and then you sit in a really hot room together until you feel good. Naruto was now confused, sauna being a word he hadn't learned yet, and the description wasn't helping with his understanding. At best he guessed that it was something like a hot springs, but without the water, and no separate rooms for girls and boys. Elsa wasn't sure she needed to go to a sauna, given how hot she was feeling at Olaf's description. So she decided to redirect the snowman before any more could be said about the topic. Olaf, I don't think Naruto needs to be any hotter than he already is. Oh yeah, the snowman replied, you're right, since he's hot enough to burn footprints into the steps of the ice palace, he probably shouldn't be going to any warm places. A loud groan resounded from a nearby Kristoff. I knew I was forgetting to tell you something. The ice harvester held his head, muttering about driving his sleigh all day. Oh, what's the big deal? Anna called out. We all knew that Naruto would probably melt some of the ice, and it's not like it's a problem or anything. Unless the steps are over something dangerous, like the gorge that leads to the palace, Elsa pointed out, while staring sternly at Kristoff whose nod confirmer that was, indeed, where the damage was. It would definitely be bad if someone fell down there, Anna admitted, sheepishly. Which is why I need to go and fix it as soon as possible, Elsa said, forgetting about the part and late hour. A sudden movement broke everyone form the conversation, as Naruto had started waving his arm to get their attention. If you are talking about where I walked on the ice without shoes, Marshmallow showed me, and I have been jumping over the stairs ever since. The ninja explained as best he could. What I think Naruto's trying to say is that the steps are safe for the moment Kristoff offered in agreement with his friend. Last time I was up there the footprints were noticeable but shallow, so I don't think there's a reason to go charging up the mountain right now, at night. Elsa released a sigh, knowing it was true. Very well, but I will have to go with Naruto when he returns to the ice palace, so I can fix and reinforce the steps. How about you go up after the new year, Anna recommended. That way Naruto can stay in the castle with us for a little bit. Yeah, an excited Ingrid interrupted the princess, before letting out a loud yawn, 
and laying her own head atop Naruto's. Elsa relented and agreed with Ingrid that it was getting late. As one the group made their way over to Kristoff's sleigh. Several other families following similar strategies, ushering their own sleepy children home. As they continued to walk, Elsa noticed a pair of discarded gloves in the snow. Given how thick they looked, she had to believe they belonged to Naruto. A smile peeked onto her face as she watched the blonde, his bare hands gently keeping Ingrid in place as he moved, making sure not to grip her too tightly, for fear of burning the little girl, yet still ensuring that she would never fall. When they reached Kristoff's sleigh, Naruto first lowered a now sleeping Ingrid onto a seat, and covered her with a spare blanket to keep her warm. Once he had finished tucking in the little girl, the Yuzumaki reached over and picked up a medium-sized package, crudely wrapped in paper and tied with a piece of string. The blonde presented the parcel to Elsa. Kristoff told me this was a winter festival, and that people normally give gifts to each other, Naruto explained. As the queen accepted the gift, she wasn't sure how she felt about the gesture. While she had received plenty of gifts for her birthday, just days ago in fact, she had not expected to be given anything from her whisker-cheeked friend especially since he had been living on top of a mountain. Taking the package, she felt the leftover heat from where Naruto had been holding it, a reminder that he still wasn't wearing his gloves, and that, along with the surprise present, brought a wide smile to the Ice Queen, happy that her fellow blonde was healing and would soon be able to take off his gloves for good, much like she had done earlier in the year. Tearing into the paper with all the refinement an anxious royal could have, Elsa had soon freed her gift, and came face to face with herself, an ice sculpture in her own image. The statuette was roughly shaped, but still unmistakably a recreation of her. It's beautiful, she said, tenderly holding the icy gift. I was thinking about ways to use up more magic, and I decided to start cutting blocks of ice, Naruto said, rubbing the back of his head in nervousness. I am just glad that I could get it to look like you. You cut ice? Elsa asked, adjusting the statuette in her arms. For my magic I have a natural wind ability. Elsa was glad that she would have until the new year to spend with her friend, so she could try to figure out what he meant by that. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 3. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.